Naked Empire by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 475. Verna took a good grip on Rika's arm and started her walking. General Meifert sent for me. Maybe you'd best come along. That way, if he wants you too, we won't have to send someone looking for you. Rika shrugged. Fine by me. The moored Sith's expression turned suspicious. Do you have any idea what's wrong? As Verna kept an eye on the messenger ahead of her, weaving his way among men, tents, wagons, horses, and repair stations, she glanced over at Rika. Nothing that I know of. Verna's expression contorted a bit as she tried to put her queasy mood into words. Did you ever wake up and just feel like there was something wrong, but you couldn't explain why it seemed like it was going to be a bad day? If it's to be a bad day, I see to it that it's someone else's, and I'm the cause of it. Verna smiled to herself. Too bad you're not gifted. You would make a good sister of the light. I would rather be Mord Sith and be able to protect Lord Ral. The messenger stopped at the side of the camp road. Back there, prelate. General Myford said to bring you to that tent by the trees. Verna thanked the young man and made her way across the soft ground, Rika at her side. The tent was away from the main activity of the camp, in a quieter area where officers often met with scouts just back from patrols. Verna's mind raced, trying to imagine what news scouts could have brought back. There was no alarm, so the passes still held. If there was trouble, there would be a flurry of activity in the camp, but it seemed about the same as any other day. Guards saw Verna coming and ducked into the tent to announce her arrival. Almost immediately, the general stepped out of the tent and rushed to meet her. His blue eyes reflected iron determination. The man's face, though, was ashen. I saw Rika, Verna explained as General Meifert dipped his head in a hurried greeting. I thought I ought to bring her just in case you needed her, too. The tall, blonde-headed Daharan glanced briefly at Rika. Yes, that's fine. Come in, please, both of you. Verna snatched his sleeve. What's this about? What's going on? Is something wrong? The general's eyes moved to Rika and back to Verna. We've had a message from Jagang. Rika leaned in, her voice taking on an edge. How did a messenger from Jagang get through without someone killing them? It was standard practice that no one came through for any reason. They didn't want so much as a mouse making it through. There was no telling if it might be some kind of trick. It was a small wagon pulled by a single horse. He tilted his head toward Verna. The men thought the wagon was empty. Remembering your instructions, they let it through. Verna was somewhat surprised that Anne's warning to let an empty wagon through had been so correct. A wagon came of its own accord? An empty wagon drove itself in? Not exactly. The men who saw it thought it was empty. The horse appears to be a workhorse that is used to walking roads, so it plodded along the road as it had been trained. General Meifert pressed his lips together at the confusion on Verna's face and then turned away from the tent. Come on and I'll show you. He led them to the third tent down the line and held the flap aside. Verna ducked in, followed by Rika and the general. On a bench inside sat a young novice, Holly, with her arm around a very frightened-looking girl no more than ten years old. I asked Holly to stay with her, General Meifert whispered. I thought it might make her less nervous than a soldier standing over her. Of course, Verna said. Very wise of you. She's the one who brought the message then? The young general nodded. She was sitting in the back of the wagon, so the men seeing it coming at first thought it was empty. Verna now understood why such a messenger got through. Soldiers weren't nearly so likely to kill a child, and the sisters could test her to ensure she was no threat. Verna wondered if Zed would have something to say about that. Threat often came in surprising packages. Verna approached the pair on the bench, smiling as she bent down. I'm Verna. Are you all right, young lady? The girl nodded. Would you like something to eat? Trembling slightly as her big brown eyes took in the people looking at her, she nodded again. Prelate, Holly said. Valerie already went to get her something. I see, Verna said, holding the smile in place.
she knelt down and gently patted the girl's hands in her lap to reassure her. Do you live around here? The girl's big brown eyes blinked, trying to judge the danger of the adult before her. She calmed just a little at Verna's smile and kind touch. A bit of travel to the north, ma'am. And someone sent you to see us? The big brown eyes filled with tears, but she didn't cry. My parents are back there, down over the pass. The soldiers there have them. As guests, they said. Men came and took us to their army. We've had to stay there for the last few weeks. Today, they told me to take a letter over the pass to the people here. They said that if I did as I was told, they would let my mother and father and me go home. Verna again patted the girl's small hands. I see. Well, that's good of you to help your parents. I just want to go home. And you shall, child, Verna straightened. We'll get you some food, dear, so you have a full tummy before you go back to your parents. The girl stood and curtsied. Thank you for your kindness. May I go back after I eat then? Certainly, Verna said. I'll just go read the letter you brought while you have a nice meal, and then you can return to your parents. As she sat back up on the bench, squirming her bottom back beside Holly, she couldn't help keeping a wary eye on the moored Sith. Trying not to show any apprehension, Verna smiled her goodbye to the girl before leading the others out of the tent. She couldn't even imagine what Jagang was up to. What's in the letter? Verna asked as they hurried to the command tent. General Myford paused outside the tent, his thumb burnishing a brass button on his coat as he held Verna's gaze. I'd just as soon you read it for yourself, Prelate. Some of it is plain enough. Some of it, well, some of it I'm hoping you can explain to me. Stepping into the tent, Verna saw Captain Zimmer waiting off to the side. The square-jawed man was absent his usual infectious smile. The captain was in charge of the Daharan Special Forces, a group of men whose job it was to go out and spend their days and nights sneaking around in enemy territory, killing as many of the enemy as possible. There seemed to be an endless supply. The captain seemed determined to use up the supply. The men in Captain Zimmer's corps were very good at what they did. They collected strings of ears they took from the enemies they killed. Kalin used to always ask to see their collection whenever they returned. The captain and his men dearly missed her. They all glanced up at a flash of lightning. The storm was getting closer. After a moment's pause, the ground shook with the rolling rumble of thunder. General Myfert retrieved a small folded paper from the table and handed it to Verna. This is what the girl brought. Looking briefly to the two men's grim expressions, Verna unfolded the paper and read the neat script. I have Wizard Zorander and a sorceress named Addy. I now hold the wizard's keep in Aiden Drill and all it contains. My slide will soon present me with Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor. Your cause is lost. If you surrender now and open the passes, I will spare your men. If you do not, I will put every one of them to death. Signed, Jagang the Just. The arm holding the paper in her trembling fingers lowered. Dear Creator, Verna whispered. She felt dizzy. Rika snatched the paper from her hand and stood facing away as she read it. She cursed under her breath. We have to go get him, Rika said. We have to get Zed and Addy away from Jagang. Captain Zimmer shook his head. There is no way we could accomplish such a thing. Rika's face went red with rage. He saved my life before. Yours too. We have to get him out of there. In contrast to Rika's anger, Verna spoke softly. We all feel the same about him. Zed has probably saved all of our lives more than once. Unfortunately, Jagang will do all the worst to him for it. Rika shook the message before their faces. So we are just going to let him die there? Let Jagang kill him? We sneak in or something. Captain Zimmer rested the heel of his hand on a long knife at his belt. Mistress Rika, if I told you that I had a man hidden somewhere in this camp, 
in one of the hundreds of thousands of tents, and no one would bother you or ask you any questions, but would allow you to freely go about a search, how long do you think it would take you to find such a hidden man? But they won't be in just any tent, Rika said. Look at us here. This message came. Did it go to just any random tent in the whole camp? No. It went to a place where such things are handled. I've been to the Imperial Order encampment too many times to count, Captain Zimmer said as he cast his arm out toward the enemy over the mountains to the west. You can't even imagine how big their camp is. They have millions of men there. Their encampment is a quagmire of cutthroats. It's a place of chaos. That disorder allows us to slip in, kill some of them, and get out fast. You don't want to be there very long. They recognize outsiders, especially blonde outsiders. Moreover, there are layers of different kinds of men. Most of the soldiers are little more than a mob of thugs that Jagang turns loose from time to time. None of them are allowed beyond a certain point within their own camp. The men guarding the areas with higher security are not nearly so stupid and lazy as the common soldiers. The men in those protected areas aren't as numerous as the common soldiers, but they are trained professionals. They are alert, vigilant, and deadly. If you could somehow manage to get through the sea of misfits to reach the island at the core where the torture and command tents are, those professional soldiers would have you on the end of a pike in no time. Even they are not all the same. The outer ring of this core, besides having these professionals guarding it, is where the sisters are. They both live there and use magic to watch for intruders. Beyond them are further rings, starting with the elite guards, and then, finally, the emperor's personal guards. These are men who have been fighting with Jagang for years. They kill anyone, even the elite guard officers, if they become at all suspicious of them. If they even hear word of someone saying disparaging things about the emperor, they hunt them down and have them tortured. After being tortured, if they live through it, they are then put to death. I'm not saying that my men and I would be unwilling to risk our lives trying to get Zed out of there. I'm saying that we would be giving our lives up for nothing. The mood in the tent could not have been more hopeless. The general gestured with the paper when Rika handed it back. Any idea what a slide is, prelate? Verna met his blue-eyed gaze. A soul stealer. The general frowned. A what? In the Great War, 3,000 years ago, the wizards of that time created weapons out of people. Dreamwalkers, like Jagang, were one such weapon. The best way I can explain it to you is that a slide is in some ways like a dreamwalker. A dreamwalker can enter a person's mind and seize control of them. A slide, I believe, is something like that, only he seizes your spirit, your soul. Rika made a face. Why? Verna lifted her hands in frustration. I don't really know. To control their victim, perhaps. Altering gifted people was an ancient practice. They sometimes changed gifted people with magic to suit a specific purpose. With subtractive magic, they took away traits they didn't want, and then they used additive magic to add to or enhance a trait they did want. What they created were monsters. I'm not really well versed in the subject. When I became prelate, I had access to books I had never seen before. That's where I saw the reference to slides. They were used to slip into another person's being and steal the essence of who they were, their spirit, their soul. Altering people in such a way as to create these slides is a long dead art. I'm afraid that I don't know a great deal about the subject. I do remember reading that the ones called slides were exceedingly dangerous. Long dead art, the general muttered. He looked like he was making a great effort to restrain himself. Those wizards of that time made such weapons as slides. But how could Jagang? He's no wizard. Could it be that he's lying? Verna thought about the question a moment. He has gifted people under his direct control. Some are able to use underworld magic. As I said, I don't know a great deal about it, but I suppose it's possible that he was able to do it. How? the general demanded. How could Jagang do such things? He's not even a wizard. Verna clasped 
clasped her hands before herself. He has sisters of the light and the dark. In theory, I suppose, he has what he needs. He is a man who studies history. I know from personal experience that he puts great value in books. He has an extensive and quite valuable collection. Nathan the prophet was very concerned about this very thing and destroyed a number of important volumes before they could fall into Jagang's possession. Still, the emperor possesses a great many others. In fact, he has a huge collection. Now that he has captured the keep, he has access to important libraries. Those books are dangerous, or they wouldn't have been sealed away in the wizard's keep in the first place. And now Jagang has control of them. General Meifert ran his fingers back through his hair. He gripped the back of the chair set before the small table and leaned his weight on his arms. Do you think he really has Zed and Adi? The question was a plea for some thread of hope. Verna swallowed as she carefully considered the question. She answered in an honest voice, not wanting to be the founder of a false faith. Since she'd read the message from Jagang, she herself had been searching for that same thread of hope. I don't think he's a man who would find any satisfaction in bragging about something he hadn't actually accomplished. I think he must be telling us the truth and wants to gloat over his accomplishment. The general released his grip on the chair and turned as he considered Verna's words. Finally, he asked a question worse yet. Do you think he's telling the truth that this slide has Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor? Do you think this terrible creation, this slide, will soon deliver the two of them to Jagang? Verna wondered if this was the reason for Anne and Nathan's headlong rush down through the old world. Verna knew that Richard and Kalen were down there somewhere. There could be no more urgent reason for Anne and Nathan to race south. Was it possible that this slide had already captured them or captured their souls? Verna's heart sank. She wondered if Anne already knew that the slide had Richard and that was why she wasn't saying much about her mission. I don't know, Verna finally answered. I think Jagang just made a mistake, Captain Zimmer said. Verna lifted an eyebrow. Such as? He has just betrayed to us how much trouble he's having with the passes. He's just told us how well our defenses are working and how desperate he is. If he doesn't get through this season, his whole army will have to sit out another winter. He wants us to let him through. The Haren winters are hard, especially on men such as his, men not used to the conditions. I saw with my own eyes good indications of how many men he lost last winter. Hundreds of thousands of men died from disease. He has plenty of men, General Meifert said. He can afford the losses. He has a steady supply of new troops to replace the ones who died from the fevers and sickness last winter. So you think the captain is wrong? Verna asked. No, I agree that Jagang would like very much to get it over with. I just don't think he cares how many of his men die. I think he's eager to rule the world. Patient as he generally is, he sees the end at hand, the goal within his grasp. We're the only thing standing in his way, keeping his prize from falling to him. His men, too, are impatient for the plunder. His choice to split the new world first by driving up to Aedendril has left him close to his goal, but in some ways even more distant from it. If he can't make it through the passes, he may decide to pick up his army and make a long march back south again to the Kern River Valley to where he can then come over and up into the Hara. Once his army takes to the open ground down south, there's no way for us to stop him. If he can't break through the passes now, it means a long march and a long delay, but he will still have us in the end. He would rather have us now and is willing to offer the lives of our men to close a deal. Verna stared off. It's a grave mistake to try to appease evil. I agree, General Meifert said. Once we opened the passes, he would slaughter every last man. The mood in the tent was as gloomy as the sky outside. I think we should send him back a letter, Rika said. I think we should tell him that we don't believe him that he has Zed and Addy. If he expects us to believe him, he should prove it. He should send us their heads. 
Captain Zimmer smiled at the suggestion. The general tapped a finger on the table as he thought it over. If it's as you say, prelate, and Jagang really does have them, then there's nothing we can do about it. He will kill them. After what Zed did to Jagang's force back in Aedendril, to say nothing of all the havoc he caused the Imperial Order last summer when the Mother Confessor was with us, I know it won't be an easy death, but he will kill them in the end. Then you agree that nothing else can be done, Verna said. General Meifert wiped a hand across his face. I hate admitting it, but I'm afraid they're lost. I don't think we should give Jagang the satisfaction of knowing how we truly feel about it. Verna's head spun at the thought of Zed and Addy being put to torture, of them being in the hands of Jagang and his sisters of the dark. She quailed at the thought of the Daharan forces losing Zed. There simply was no one with his experience and knowledge. There was no one who could replace him. We write Jagang a letter then, Verna said, and tell Jagang we don't believe he has Zed and Addy. The only thing we can do, Rika said, is to deny Jagang what he wants most. What he wants is for us to give up. General Meifert pulled out the chair at the table, inviting Verna to sit and write the letter. If Jagang is angered by such a letter, he just might send us their heads. If he did, that would spare them terrible suffering. That's the only thing we can do for them, the best we could do for them. Verna took stock of the grim faces and saw only resolve at what had to be done. She sat in the chair the general held for her, wiggled the stopper out of the ink bottle, and then took a piece of paper from a small stack in a box to the side. She dipped the pen and stared at the paper for a moment, trying to decide how to phrase the letter. She tried to imagine what Kalin would write. As it came to her, she bent over the table and began writing. I don't believe you are competent enough to capture Wizard Zerander. If you were, you would send us his head to prove it. Don't bother me any more with your whining for us to open the passes for you because you are too inept to do it yourself. Reading over Verna's shoulder, Rika said, I like it. Verna looked up at the others. How should I sign it? What would make Jagang the most angry or worried? Captain Zimmer asked. Verna tapped the back of the pen against her chin as she thought. Then it came to her. She put pen to paper. Signed, The Mother Confessor. Chapter 47 Richard scanned the site off in the broad green valley, watching for any sign of troops. He looked over to Owen. That's Witherton? Hands pressed against the rich forest floor at the crown of a low ridge, Owen pulled himself closer to the edge. He stretched his neck to see over the rise and finally nodded before pulling back. Richard had thought it would be bigger. I don't see any soldiers. Owen crawled back away from the edge. In the shadowed cover, among ferns and low scrub, he stood and brushed the moist crumbles of leaves from his shirt and trousers. The men of the Order mostly stay inside the town. They have no interest in helping to do the work. They eat our food and gamble with the things they have taken from our people. When they do these things, they are interested in little else. His face heated to red. At night, they used to collect some of our women. Since the reason was obvious enough, Owen didn't put words to it. In the daytime, they sometimes come out to check on our people who work in the fields or watch to see that they come back in at night. If the soldiers had once camped outside the city walls, they no longer did. Apparently, they preferred the more comfortable accommodations within the town. They had learned that these people would offer no resistance. They could be cowed and controlled by words alone. The men of the Imperial Order were safe, sleeping among them. The wall around Witherton blocked much of Richard's view of the place. Other than through the open gates, there wasn't much to see. The wall was constructed of upright posts not a great deal taller than the height of a man. The posts, a variety of sizes no bigger around than a hand width, were bound tightly together, top and bottom, with rope. The wavy wall snaked around the town, leaned in or out in places. There was no bulwark or even a trench before the wall. 
other than keeping out grazing deer or maybe a roaming bear, the walls certainly didn't look strong enough to withstand an attack from the Imperial Order soldiers. The soldiers had no doubt made a point of using the gate into the town for reasons other than the strength of the wall. Opening the gates for soldiers of the Imperial Order had been a symbolic sign of submission. Broad swaths of the valley were clear of trees, leaving fields of grain to grow alongside row crops in communal gardens. Tree limbs knitted into fencing kept in cows. There the wild grasses were chewed low. Chickens roamed freely near coops. A few sheep grazed on the coarse grass. The smells of rich soil, wildflowers, and grasses carried on a light breeze into the woods where Richard watched. It was a great relief to have finally descended from the pass. It had been getting difficult to breathe in the thin air up on the high slopes. It was considerably warmer, too, down out of the lofty mountain pass, although he still felt cold. Richard checked the sweep of open valley one last time and then he and Owen made their way back into the dense tangle of woods toward where the others waited. The trees were mostly hardwoods, maple and oak, along with patches of birch, but there were also stands of towering evergreens. Birds chirped from the dense foliage. A squirrel up on the limb of a pine chattered at them as they passed. The deep shade below the thick forest crown was interrupted only occasionally by mottled sunlight. Some of the men, swatting at bugs, stood in a rush when Richard led Owen into the secluded forest opening. Richard was glad to stand in the warmth of sunlight, slanting in at a low angle. It appeared that the open area in the dense woods had been created when a huge old maple had been hit by lightning. The maple split and fell in two directions, taking other trees down with it. Kaylin hopped down off her seat on the trunk of the fallen monarch. Betty, her tail wagging in a blur, greeted Richard, eagerly looking for attention or a treat. Richard scratched behind her ears the goat's favorite form of attention. More of the men came into the open from behind upturned roots that had been turned silver by years of exposure to the elements. A crop of spruce, none more than chest high, had sprung up in the sunny spot created when the old maple had died, such a sudden and violent death. Spread among Kalen, Kara, Jensen, and Tom were the rest of the men, his army. Back up in the pass, Anson's saying that he wanted to help rid his people of the Imperial Order soldiers seemed to have galvanized the rest of the men, and the balance had finally tipped. Once it had, a lifetime of darkness and doubt gave way to a hunger to live in the light of truth. The men all declared, in a breathtaking moment of determination, that they wanted to join with Richard to be part of the Daharan Empire and fight the soldiers of the Imperial Order to gain their freedom. They had all decided that the men of the Order were evil and deserved death, even if they themselves had to do the killing. When Tom glanced down to see Betty going back to browsing on weeds, Richard noticed that the man's brow was beaded with sweat. Kara fanned herself with a handful of big leaves from a mountain maple. Richard was about to ask them how they could be sweating when it was such a cool day when he realized that it was the poison making him cold. With icy dread, he recalled how the last time he had gotten cold, the poison had nearly killed him that awful night. Anson and the other man, John, took off their packs. They were the ones planning to slip in among the field workers returning to town at nightfall. Once they sneaked into town, the two men planned to recover the antidote. I think I'd better go with you, Richard said to Anson. John, why don't you wait here with the others? John looked surprised. If you wish, Lord Rall, but there is no need for you to go. It wasn't supposed to be a foray that would result in any violence, only the recovery of the antidote. The attack on the Imperial Order soldiers was to be after the antidote had been safely recovered and they had assessed the situation, the number of men, and the layout. John is right. Kara said, they can do it. Richard was having difficulty breathing. He had to make an effort not to cough. I know, I just think I had better have a look myself. Kara and Kalin cast sidelong glances at each other. But if you go in there with Anson, Jensen said, you can't take your sword. I'm not going to start a war. I just want to get a good look around at the place. Kalin stepped closer. The two of them can scout the town and give you a report. 
You can rest. They will only be gone a few hours. I know, but I don't think I want to wait that long. By the way she appraised his eyes, he thought she must be able to see how much pain he was in. She didn't argue the point further, but instead nodded her agreement. Richard pulled the baldric and sword belt off over his head. He slipped it all over Caitlin's head, laying the baldric across her shoulder. Here, I pronounce you seeker of truth. She accepted the sword and the honor by planting her fists on her hips. Now don't you go starting anything while you're in there. That's not the plan. You and Anson will be alone. You wait until we're all together. I know. I just need to get the antidote, and then we'll be back in no time. Beside getting the antidote, Richard wanted to see the enemy forces, how they were placed, and the layout of the town. Having the men draw a map in the dirt was one thing, seeing it for himself was another. These men didn't know how to evaluate threat points. One of the men took off his light coat, something a number of the men wore, and held it out to Richard. Here, Lord Ralph, wear this. It will make you look more like one of us. With a nod of thanks, Richard drew the coat on, he had changed out of his war wizard's outfit into traveling clothes, so he didn't think he would look out of place with the way the men from the town of Witherton looked. The man was nearly Richard's size, so the coat fit well enough. It also hid his belt knife. Jensen shook her head. I don't know, Richard. You just don't look like one of them. You still look like Lord Rawl. What are you talking about? Richard held out his arms, looking down at himself. What's wrong with the way I look? Don't stand up so straight, she said. Hunch your shoulders and hang your head a little, Kalen offered. Richard took their advice seriously. He hadn't thought about it, but the men did tend to hunch a lot. He didn't want to stand out. He had to blend in if he didn't want to raise the suspicions of the soldiers. He bent over a little. How's that? Jensen screwed up her mouth. Not much different. But I'm bending down. Lord Rahl, Kara said in a soft voice as she gave him a meaningful look. You remember how it was to walk behind Denna when she held the chain to the collar around your neck? Make yourself like that. Richard blinked at her. The mental image of his time as a captive of a moored Sith hit him like a slap. He pressed his lips tight, not saying anything, and conceded with a single nod. The memory of that forsaken time was depressing enough that he would have no trouble using it to fall into the role. We had better be on our way, Anson said. Now that the sun is falling behind the mountains, darkness comes quickly. He hesitated, then spoke again. Lord Rahl, the men of the Order will not know you. I mean, they probably will not realize you aren't from our town. But our people do not carry weapons. If they see that knife, they will know you are not from our town, and they will send up an alarm. Richard lifted open the coat, looking at the knife. You're right. He loosened his belt and removed the sheath holding the knife. He handed it to Kara for safekeeping. Richard cupped a hand quickly to the side of Kalin's face as a way of saying his goodbye. She seized the hand in both of hers and pressed a quick kiss to the backs of his fingers. Her hands looked so small and delicate holding his. He sometimes kidded her that he didn't see how she could possibly get anything done with such small hands. Her answer was that her hands were a normal size and perfectly adequate, and his were simply outsized. The men all noticed Kalin's gesture of affection. Richard was not embarrassed that they did. He wanted them to know that other people were the same as they in important human ways. This was what they were fighting for, the chance to be human, to love and cherish loved ones, to live their lives as they wanted. The light faded quickly as Richard and Anson made their way through the woods running beside fields of wild grasses. Richard wanted to work around to where the forest came in closer to the men out weeding in the gardens and tending to animals. With the nearby mountains to the west being so high, the sun vanished behind them earlier than what would normally be sunset, leaving the sky a swath of deep bluish green and the valley in an odd golden gloom. By the time he and Anson had reached the place where they would leave the woods, it was still a little too light, so they waited a short while while Richard felt the murky light in the fields was dim enough to hide them. The town was some distance away, and since Richard couldn't make out any men outside the gates, 
he reasoned that if soldiers were watching, then they couldn't see him either. As they moved quickly through the field of wild grass, staying low and out of sight, Anson pointed. There, those men going back to town, we should follow them. Richard spoke quietly back over his shoulder. All right, but don't forget, we don't want to catch up with them or they might recognize you and make a fuss. Let them stay a good distance ahead of us. When they reached the town walls, Richard saw that the gates were no more than two sections of the picket walls. A couple of posts no bigger than Richard's wrist had been tied sideways to stiffen two sections of wall and make them into gates. The ropes that tied the posts together served as the hinges. The sections were simply lifted and swung around to open or close them. It was far from a secure fortification. In the murky light of twilight, the two guards milling around just inside the gates and watching workers return couldn't really see much of Richard and Anson. To the guards, they would appear to be two more workers. The order understood the value of workers. They needed slaves to do the work so that the soldiers might eat. Richard hunched his shoulders and hung his head as he walked. He remembered those terrible times as a captive when, wearing a collar, he walked behind Denna, devoid of all hope of ever again being free. Thinking of that inhuman time, he shuffled through the open gates. The guards didn't pay him any attention. Just as they were nearly past the guards, the closest one reached out and snatched Anson's sleeve, spinning him back around. I want some eggs, the young soldier said. Give me some of the eggs you collected. Anson stood wide-eyed, not knowing what to do. It seemed ludicrous that these two young men were allowed to serve their cause by being bullies. Richard stepped up beside Anson and spoke quickly, remembering to bow his head so that he wouldn't loom over the man. We have no eggs, sir. We were weeding the bean fields. I'm sorry. We will bring you eggs tomorrow if it pleases you. Richard glanced up just as the guard backhanded him, knocking him flat on his back. He instantly took a firm grip on his anger. Wiping blood from his mouth, he decided to stay where he was. He's right, Anson said, drawing the guard's attention. We were weeding beans. If you wish it, we will bring you some eggs tomorrow, as many as you want. The guard grunted a curse at them and swaggered off, taking his companion with him. They headed for a nearby long, low structure with a torch lashed to a pole outside a low door. In the flickering light of that torch, Richard couldn't make out what the place was, but it appeared to be a building dug partway into the ground so that the eaves were at eye level. After the two soldiers were a safe distance away, Anson offered Richard a hand to help him up. Richard didn't think he'd been hit that hard, but his head was spinning. As they started out, faces back in doorways and around dark corners peeked out to watch them. When Richard looked their way, the people ducked back in. They know you are not from here, Anson whispered. Richard didn't trust that one of those people wouldn't call the guards. Let's hurry up and get what we came here for. Anson nodded and hurriedly led Richard down a narrow street with what looked like little more than huts huddled together to each side. The single torch burning outside the long building where the soldiers had gone provided little light down the street. The town, at least what Richard could see of it in the dark, was a pretty shabby-looking place. In fact, he wouldn't call it a town so much as a village. Many of the structures appeared to be housing for livestock, not people. Only rarely were there any lights coming from any of the squat buildings, and the light he did see looked like it came from candles, not lamps. At the end of the street, Richard followed Anson through a small side door into a large building. The cows inside mooed at the intrusion. Sheep rustled in their pens. A few goats in other pens bleated. Richard and Anson paused to let the animals settle down before making their way through the barn to a ladder at the side. Richard followed Anson as he climbed quickly to a small hayloft. At the end of the loft, Anson reached up over a low rafter to where it tied into the wall behind a cross brace. Here it is, he said, as he grimaced, stretching his arm up into the hiding place. He came out with a small, square-sided bottle and handed it to Richard. This is the antidote. Hurry and drink it, and then let's get out of here. The large door banged open. 
Even though it was dark outside, the torch down the street provided just enough light to silhouette the broad shape of a man standing in the doorway. By his demeanor, he had to be a soldier. Richard pulled the stopper from the bottle. The antidote had the slight aroma of cinnamon. He quickly downed it, hardly noticing its sweet, spicy taste. He never took his eyes off the man in the doorway. Who's in here? The man bellowed. Sir, Richard called down, I'm just getting some hay for the livestock. In the dark? What are you up to? Get down here right now. Richard put a hand against Anson's chest and pushed him back into the darkness. Yes, sir, I'm coming, Richard called to the soldier as he hurried down the ladder. At the bottom of the ladder, he turned and saw the man coming toward him. Richard reached for his knife under the coat he was wearing, only remembering then that he didn't have his knife. The soldier was still silhouetted against the open barn door. Richard was in the darkness, and the man probably wouldn't be able to see him. He silently moved away from the ladder. As the soldier passed near him, Richard stepped in behind him and reached to his side, seizing the knife sheathed behind the axe hanging on his belt. Richard gingerly drew the knife just as the man stopped and looked up the ladder to the hayloft. As he was looking up, Richard snatched a fistful of hair with one hand and reached around with the other, slicing deep through the soldier's throat before he realized what was happening. Richard held the man tight as he struggled, a wet gurgling the only sound coming from him. He reached back, frantically grabbing at Richard for a moment before his movements lost their energy and he went limp. Anson, Richard whispered up the ladder as he let the man slip to the ground. Come on, let's go. Anson hurried down the ladder, coming to a halt as he reached the bottom and turned around to see the dark shape of the dead man sprawled on the ground. What happened? Richard looked up from his work at undoing the weapon belt around the dead weight of the soldier. I killed him. Oh. Richard handed the knife in its sheath to Anson. Here you go. Now you have a real weapon, a long knife. Richard rolled the dead soldier over to pull the belt the rest of the way out from under the man. As he tugged it free, he heard a noise and turned just in time to see another soldier running in toward them. Anson slammed the long knife hilt deep into the man's chest. The man staggered back. Richard shot to his feet, bringing the weapon belt with him. The soldier gasped for breath as he clutched at the knife handle. He dropped heavily to his knees. One hand clawed at the air above him as he swayed. Pulling a final gasp, he toppled to his side. Anson stood staring at the man lying in a heap, the knife jutting from his chest. He bent then, and pulled his new knife free. Are you all right? Richard whispered when Anson stood. Anson nodded. I recognize this man. We called him the weasel. He deserved to die. Richard gently clapped Anson on the back of the shoulder. You did well. Now let's get out of here. As they made their way back up the street, Richard asked Anson to wait while he checked down alleyways and between low buildings, searching for soldiers. As a guide, Richard often scouted at night. In the darkness, he was in his element. The town was a lot smaller than he had expected. It was also much less organized than he thought it would be, with no apparent order to where the simple structures had been built. The streets through the haphazard town, if they could be called streets, were in most cases little more than footpaths between clusters of small, single-room buildings. He saw a few hand carts, but nothing more elaborate. There was only one road through the town, leading back to the barn where they had recovered the antidote and run into the two soldiers, that was wide enough to accommodate a wagon. His search didn't turn up any patrolling soldiers. Do you know if all the men of the order stayed together? Richard asked when he returned to Anson waiting in the shadows. At night they go inside. They sleep in our place, by where we came in. You mean that low building where the first two soldiers went? That's right. That's where most people used to gather at night, but now the men of the order use it for themselves. Richard frowned at the man. You mean you all slept together? Anson sounded mildly surprised by the question. Yes, we were together whenever possible. Many people had a house where they could work, eat, and keep belongings, but they rarely slept in them. 
We usually all slept in the sleeping houses where we gathered to talk about the day. Everyone wanted to be together. Sometimes people would sleep in another place, but mostly we slept there together so we can all feel safe. Much like we all slept together at night as we made our way down out of the pass with the statue. And everyone just lay down together? Anson diverted his eyes. Couples often slept apart from others by being with one another under a single blanket, but they were still together with our people. In the dark, though, no one could see them together under a blanket. Richard had trouble imagining such a way of life. The whole town fit in that sleeping building? There was enough room? No, there were too many of us to all sleep in one sleeping house. There are two, Anson pointed. There is another on the far side of the one you saw. Let's go have a look then. They moved quickly back toward the town gates, such as they were, and toward the sleeping houses. The dark street was empty. Richard didn't see anyone on the paths between buildings. What people were left in the town had apparently gone to sleep or were afraid to come out in the darkness. A door in one of the small homes opened a crack as if someone inside were peering out. The door opened wider and a thin figure dashed out toward them. Anson, came the whispered voice. It was a boy in his early teens. He fell to his knees and clutched Anson's arm, kissing his hand in joy to see him. Anson, I am so happy that you are home. We've missed you so much. We feared for you, feared that you were murdered. Anson grabbed the boy by his shirt and hauled him to his feet. Bernie, I'm well, and I'm happy to see you well, but you must go back in now. The men will see you if they catch you outside. Oh, please, Anson, come sleep at our house. We're so alone and afraid. Who? Just me and my grandfather now. Please come in and be with us. I can't right now. Maybe another time. The boy peered up at Richard then, and when he saw that he didn't recognize him, shrank back. This is a friend of mine, Bernie, from another town. Anson squatted down beside the boy. Please, Bernie, I will return, but you must go back inside and stay there tonight. Don't come out. We fear there might be trouble. Stay inside. Tell your grandfather my words. Will you now? Bernie finally agreed and ran back into the dark doorway. Richard was eager to get out of the town before anyone else came out to pay their respects. If he and Anson weren't careful, they would end up attracting the attention of the soldiers. They moved quickly the rest of the way up the street, using buildings for cover. Pressing up against the side of one at the head of the street, Richard peered around the corner at the squat, daub and wattle sleeping house where the guards had gone. The door was open, letting soft light spill out across the ground. In there, Richard whispered. You all slept in there? Yes, that is one of the sleeping houses, and beyond it, the other one. Richard thought about it for a moment. What did you sleep on? Hay. We put blankets over it usually. We changed the hay often to keep it fresh, but these men do not bother. They sleep like animals in dusty old hay. Richard looked out through the open gates at the fields. He looked back at the sleeping house. And now the soldiers all sleep in there? Yes, they took the place from us. They said it was to be their barracks. Now our people, the ones still alive, must sleep wherever they can. Richard made Anson stay put while he slipped through the shadows out of the light of the torch to survey the area beyond the first building. The second long structure also had soldiers inside laughing and talking. There were more men than there were needed to guard such a small place, but Witherton was the gateway into Bandakar and the gateway out. Come on, Richard said as he came up beside Anson. Let's get back to the others. I have an idea. As they made their way to the gate, Richard looked up, as he often did, to check the starry sky for any sign of black-tipped races. He saw instead that the pole to each side of the gate held a body hanging by the ankles. When Anson saw them, he paused, held frozen by the horror of the sight. Richard laid a hand on the man's shoulder and leaned close. Are you all right? Anson shook his head. No, but I will be better when the men who come to us and do such things are dead. Chapter 48 Richard didn't know if the antidote was supposed to make him feel better, but if it was, it hadn't yet done its work. As they crept through the pitch-black fields, 
His chest hurt with every breath he took. He paused and closed his eyes briefly against the pain of the headache caused by his gift. He wanted nothing more than to lie down, but there was no time for that. Everyone started out once more when he did, quietly making their way through the fields outside of Witherton. It felt good at least to have his sword back, even if he dreaded the thought of having to draw it for fear of finding its magic was no longer there for him. Once they recovered the other two bottles of the antidote and he was rid of the poison, then maybe they could make it back to Nietzsche so that she could help him deal with his gift. He tried not to worry if a sorceress could help a wizard once his gift had gone out of control as his had. Nietzsche had vast experience. As soon as he reached her, she could help him. Even if she couldn't help him, he felt confident that she would at least know what he had to do in order to get the help he needed. After all, she was once a Sister of the Light. The purpose of the Sisters of the Light had been to help those with the gift to learn to control it. I think I see the outer wall, Kalin said in a quiet voice. Yes, that's the place, Richard pointed. There's the gate. See it? I think so, she whispered back. It was a dark night with no moon. While the others were having difficulty seeing much of anything as they made their way through the dark, Richard was glad for the conditions. The starlight was enough for him to see by, but he didn't think it was enough to give the soldiers any help in seeing them. As they crept closer, the sleeping house came into view through the open gate. The torch still burned outside the door to the building where the soldiers slept. Richard signaled everyone to gather around close. They all crouched low. He grabbed the shoulder of Anson's shirt and pulled him up closer yet, then did the same with Owen. Both now carried battle axes. Anson also carried the knife he'd earned. The rest of the men carried the weapons they had helped finish making. When Richard and Anson had returned to the forest clearing, Anson had told the waiting men everything that had happened. When he said that he had killed the man called the Weasel, Richard held his breath not sure exactly how the men would react to hearing that one of their own had actually killed a man. There was a brief moment of astonished silence and then spontaneous joy at the accomplishment. Every man wanted to shake Anson's hand to congratulate him, to tell him how proud they were. At that moment, any lingering doubts Richard harbored had vanished. He had allowed the men to celebrate briefly while he waited for the night to darken and then they had started making their way through the fields. This was the night that Witherton gained its freedom. Richard looked around at all the dark shapes. All right, now, remember all the things we've told you. You must stay quiet and hold the gate steady while Anson and Owen cut the rope where they hinge. Be careful not to let the gates fall once the ropes are cut. In the dim starlight, Richard could just make out the men nodding to his instructions. Richard carefully checked the sky, looking for any sign of black-tipped races. He didn't see any. It had been a long time since they'd seen any races. It seemed that the trick of taking to the forests just before they changed their expected route and being careful to stay out of sight from the sky had worked. It was possible that they had succeeded in slipping out from under Nicholas the Slide's surveillance. If they really had escaped his observation, then he wouldn't know where to begin looking for them. Richard briefly squeezed Kalin's hand and then started for the opening in the town wall. Kara crouched close at his other side. Tom was bringing up the rear, along with Jensen, making sure there were no surprises from behind. They had left Betty not only tied up, but confined to a makeshift pen to be sure she didn't follow after them and give them away at the wrong moment. The goat had been unusually distraught to be left behind, but with lives at stake, they couldn't risk Jensen's goat causing trouble. She would be happy enough after they returned. When they reached the fields close to the town gates, Richard motioned for everyone to get down and stay where they were. Along with Tom, Richard moved up to the gates, taking cover in the shadow of the wall. There was a soldier just inside the gate, pacing slowly in his lonely nighttime sentry duty. He wasn't being very careful, or he would not be doing such duty in the light of the torch. As the soldier turned to walk away from them, Tom slipped up behind the man and swiftly silenced him. As Tom dragged the dead man through the gates to hide him in the darkness outside the wall, 
Richard moved in through the gates, staying in the shadows and away from the torch burning outside the sleeping house. The door to the sleeping house stood open, but no light or sound came from inside. This late, the men were bound to be asleep. He moved past the first long building to the second, and there came upon another guard. Quickly, silently, Richard seized the man and cut his throat, holding him tight as he struggled. When he finally went limp, Richard laid him in the darkness at the head of the second sleeping house, around the corner from the torchlight. In the distance, the men had already swarmed over the gates, holding them up while Anson and Owen moved quickly at cutting the ropes that acted as hinges. In moments, both sections of gate were freed. Richard could hear the soft grunts of effort as the heavy gates were manhandled around by the two gangs of men. Jensen handed Richard his bow, the string already strung. She handed him one of the special arrows, holding the rest at the ready for him. Kalin slipped up to the torch on the pole outside the first building and lit several small torches, handing each of them off to the men. She kept one for herself. Richard knocked the arrow and then glanced around at the faces seeming to float before him in the wavering torchlight. In answer to the unspoken question, they all nodded that they were ready. He checked the men balancing the two gates and saw their nod. The bow in one hand, with his fist holding the arrow in place, Richard gave hand signals to the men starting them moving. What had been a slow, careful approach from the woods into the town suddenly transformed into a headlong rush. Richard held the head of the arrow knocked in his bow in the flame of the torch Kalin held out for him. As soon as it caught, he ran to the open door of the sleeping house, leaned into the darkness, and fired the arrow toward the back. As the blazing arrow flew the length of the building, it illuminated row upon row of men sleeping on the bed of straw. The arrow landed at the far end, spilling flame across the straw. A few heads lifted at the confusing sight. Jensen handed Richard another. He immediately drew string to cheek and the arrow shot toward the middle of the interior. As Richard pulled back from the doorway, two men with torches dripping flaming drops of pitch heaved them just inside. They hissed as they flew through the air, landing amid the sleeping men, bouncing and tumbling through the straw, igniting a wall of flame. In a matter of only a few heartbeats since the attack started, the first sleeping house was set afire from one end to the other. The largest blaze, by design, was the fire spread by the pitch-laden torches at the end of the building nearest the door. Confused cries came from inside, muted by the thick walls. The sleeping soldiers scrambled to their feet. Richard checked that the men with the heavy gates were coming. Then he ran around the sleeping house to the second building. Jensen, following close behind, handed him an arrow, the flames around its head wrapped in oil-soaked cloth, making a whooshing sound as she ran. One of his men pulled the torch from the stand outside the building where the guard Richard killed had been patrolling. Richard leaned in the doorway, only to see a big man charging at him out of the dark interior. Richard pressed his back against the door jamb and kicked the man squarely in the chest, driving him back. Richard drew the bowstring back and shot the flaming arrow off into the interior. As it lit the interior in its flight through the building, he could see that some of the men had been awakened and were getting up. Turning to take the second flaming arrow from Jensen, he saw smoke pouring up from the first building. As soon as he drew string to cheek and loosed the second arrow, he leaned away and men heaved the torches in. One torch fell back out of the doorway, it had bounced off the chest of a man rushing for the doorway to see what was happening. The pitch from the torch caught his greasy beard afire. He let out a blood-curdling scream. Richard kicked him back inside. In an instant, men by the dozens were racing for the door, not only to escape the burning building, but to meet the attack. Richard saw the flash of weapons being drawn. He sprang back from the doorway as the men carrying the heavy section of gate rushed in. They turned the gate sideways and rammed it in under the eaves. But before they could bring the bottom down to wedge it against the ground, the weight of bellowing men inside crashed into the section of gate and drove it back. The men carrying it fell back, the weight knocking them from their feet, the gate landing atop them. Suddenly, men were pouring from the doorway. 
Richard's men were ready and fell on them, driving the wooden weapons into their soft underbellies and snapping the handles off as man after man spilled out of the doorway. Standing to the side of the door, others used their maces to bash in the skulls of soldiers who emerged. When one soldier came out with his sword raised, the man to the side clubbed his arm as another rushed in and drove a wooden stake in up under his ribs. The more men who fell at the doorway, the more those trying to get out were slowed and could be dispatched. The soldiers were so stunned to see these people fighting that in some cases they fought back only ineffectually. As a soldier leaped over the bodies in the doorway and lifted a sword, a man jumped on his back and seized his arm while another stabbed him. Another, crying orders, charged Jensen, only to have the bolt of a crossbow fired into his face. A few soldiers escaped the burning building and managed to slip past Richard's men only to meet Kara's Aegeel. Their screams, worse than the cries of men on fire, briefly brought the gaze of every man from both sides of the battle. Fallen knives and swords were scooped up by the men of the town and turned on the men from the Imperial Order. Richard fired an arrow into the center of the chest of a man emerging from the smoke that rolled out of the doorway. As he was falling, a second arrow felled the man behind him. As more men rushed out, they fell over those piled around the doorway and were hacked to death with commandeered axes or stabbed with confiscated swords. Since they could emerge only one at a time, the soldiers couldn't mount a coordinated attack, but those waiting could. As Richard's men fought back those struggling to get out of the doorway of the burning building, other men rushed to help lift the gate so those under it could get up and get control of it. Once the gate was lifted, the men swung it around and, with a cry of joint effort, ran with it toward the building. They drove the top up under the eaves first, but when they brought the bottom edge down, the bodies piled in the doorway prevented them from getting the bottom down so they could wedge it in place. Richard called out orders. Some of his men rushed in and seized an arm or a leg of a dead man and dragged the body aside so the others could finally bring the bottom of the gate down against the building to close off the opening. One man from inside squeezed through just before they had the gate in place. The weight of the door pinned him against the building. Owen leaned in and with the sword he'd picked up decisively stabbed the man through the throat. As men inside pounded at the gate covering the doorway and threw their weight against it, men on the outside piled around to push it down and hold it in place. Other men fell to their knees and drove stakes into the ground to lock the gate section in place, trapping the soldiers inside. Behind, streamers of flame leaked out from under the eaves of the first building and leaped up into the night sky. The roof of the building ignited all at once, explosively engulfing the entire sleeping house in sparks and flames. Screams of men being burned alive ripped the night. The waves of heat coming off the massive fire as the first building was consumed by the flames began to carry the heavy aroma of cooking meat. It reminded Richard that for the killing he did, his gift demanded the balance of not eating meat. After all the killing of this night, since his gift was already spinning out of control, he would have to be even more careful to avoid eating any meat. His head was already hurting so much that he was having trouble focusing his vision. He couldn't afford to do anything that would further unbalance his gift. If he was not careful, the poison wouldn't get the chance to be the first to kill him. Heavy black smoke billowed out from around the edges of the gate covering the doorway of the second sleeping house. Screams and pleas came from inside. The men of the town moved back, watching as smoke began rolling up from under its eaves. The battle seemed to have ended as quickly as it had started. No one spoke as they stood in the harsh glare from the roaring fires. Flames ate through the second building. With a loud whoosh, it was engulfed in fire. The heat drove everyone back away from the two sleeping houses. As they moved back from the burning buildings, they encountered the rest of the people of the town, all gathered in the shadows, watching in stunned silence. One of the older men took a step forward. Speaker Owen, what is this? You have committed violence? Owen stepped away from the men he was with to stand before the people of his town. He held an arm back, pointing toward Richard. This is Lord Rawl of the Daharan Empire. I went in search of him to help us be free. 
We have much to tell you, but for now you must know that tonight, for the first time in many seasons, our town is free. Yes, we have helped Lord Rawl to kill the evil men who have terrorized us. We have avenged the deaths of our loved ones. We will no longer be victims. We will be free. Standing silently, the people seemed able only to stare at him. Many looked confused. Some looked quietly jubilant, but most just looked stunned. The boy, Bernie, ran up to Anson, peering up in astonishment. Anson, you and our other people have freed us? Truly? Yes. He laid a hand on Bernie's shoulder. Our town is free now. Thank you. He broke into a grin as he turned back to the town's people. We are free of the murderers. A sudden spontaneous cheer rose into the night, drowning out the sound of the crackling flames. The people rushed in around men they had not seen for months, touching them, hugging them, all asking questions of the men. Richard took Kalin's hand as he stepped back out of the way, joining Kara, Jensen, and Tom. These people who were so against violence, who lived their whole life avoiding the truth of what their beliefs caused, were now basking in the tearful joy of what it really meant to be freed from terror and violence. People slowly left their men to come and look at Richard and those standing with him. He and Kalin smiled at their obvious joy, they gathered in close before him, smiling, staring, as if Richard and those with him were some strange creatures from afar. Bernie had attached himself to Anson's arm. Others had the rest of the men firmly embraced. One by one, though, the men started pulling away so that they could stand behind Richard and Kalen. We are so happy that you are home now, people were telling the men. We have you back at last. Now we are all together again, Bernie said. We can't stay, Anson told him. Everyone in the crowd fell silent. Bernie, like many of the others, looked heartbroken. What? Buzzing, worried whispers spread through the crowd. Everyone was shaken by the news that the men were not home to stay. Owen lifted a hand so they would listen. When they went silent, he explained. The people of Bandakar are still under the cruel power of the men from the Order. Just as you have become free tonight, so must the rest of the people of Bandakar be free. Lord Rall and his wife, the Mother Confessor, as well as his friend and protector, Kara, his sister, Jensen and Tom, another friend and protector, have all agreed to help us. They cannot do it alone. We must be part of it, for this is our land. But more importantly, our people, our loved ones. Owen, you must not engage in violence, an older man said. In view of their sudden freedom, it was not an emphatic statement. It seemed to be an objection more out of obligation than anything else. You have begun a cycle of violence. Such a thing is wrong. We will speak with you before we go, so that you might come to understand as we have why we must do this to be truly free of violence and brutality. Lord Rawl has shown us that a cycle of violence is not the result of fighting back for your own life but is the result of a shrinking back from doing what is necessary to crush those who would kill you. If you do as you must in duty to yourself and your loved ones, then you will eradicate the enemy so completely that they can no longer do you any harm. Then there is no cycle of violence but an end to violence. Then and only then will true peace and freedom take root. Such actions can never accomplish anything but to start violence, an old man objected. Look around, Anson said. The violence has not begun tonight, but ended. Violence has been crushed as it should be, by crushing evil men who bring it upon us. People nodded to one another. The heady relief of being suddenly freed from the grip of the terror brought by the soldiers of the Imperial Order plainly overcoming their objections. Joy had taken over from fear. The reality of having their lives returned had opened their eyes. But you must understand, as we have come to understand, Owen said, that nothing can ever again be the way it once was. Those ways are in the past. Richard noticed that the men weren't slouching anymore. They stood with their heads held high. We have chosen to live, Owen told his people. In so doing, we have found true freedom. I think we all have, 
the old man in the crowd said. Chapter 49 Zed frowned with the effort of concentrating on what it was Sister Tahira had placed on the table before him. He looked up at her, at the way her scowl pinched in around her humped nose. Well, she demanded. Zed looked down, squinting at the thing before him. It looked like a leather-covered ball painted with faded blue and pink zigzagged lines all around it. What was it about it that seemed so familiar yet so distant? He blinked, trying to better focus his eyes. His neck ached something fierce. A father, hearing his young son in the next tent screaming in appalling agony, had grabbed Zed by the hair and yanked him away from other parents who, pulling and pawing at him, made desperate demands of their own. Because of the torn muscles in his neck, it was painful to hold up his head. Compared to the torture he'd heard, though, it was nothing. The dim interior of the tent, lit by several lamps hanging from poles, felt as if it were detached from the ground and swirling around him. The foul place stank. The heat and humidity only made the smell and the spinning worse. Zed felt as if he might pass out. It had been so long since he'd slept that he couldn't even remember the last time he had actually lain down. The only sleep he got was when he fell asleep in the chair while Sister Tahira was seeing to another object being unloaded from the wagon, or when she went to bed and the next sister hadn't yet arrived to take the next stint in their laborious cataloging of the items brought from the keep. The catnaps he got were rarely longer than a few precious minutes at a time. The guards had orders not to allow him or Addie to lie down. At least the screams of the children had ended. At least as long as he cooperated, those cries of pain had stopped. At least as long as he went along, the parents had hope. A violent crack of pain suddenly hammered the side of his head, knocking him back. The chair toppled over, spilling him to the ground. With his arms bound behind his back, he couldn't do anything to break the fall, and he hit hard. Zed's ears rang, not only from the fall, but with the aftermath of the blow of the sister's power delivered through the collar around his neck. He hated that wicked instrument of control. The sisters were not shy about exercising that control. Because the collar locked him away from the use of his own gift, he could not use his ability to defend himself. Instead, they used his power against him. It took little or no provocation to send one of the sisters into a fit of violence. Many of these women had once been kindly people devoting their lives to helping others. Jagang had enslaved them to a different cause. Now they did his bidding. Though they might have once been gentle, they were now, he knew, trying to keep one step ahead of the discipline Jagang meted out to them. That discipline could be excruciating beyond endurance. The sisters were expected to get results. Jagang would not be interested in the excuse that Zed was being difficult. Zed saw that Addie, too, had been knocked to the ground. Any punishment he received, she, too, endured. He felt more agony for her than for himself. Soldiers standing to the side moved in to right the chair and lift Zed into it. With his arms bound behind his back, he couldn't get up by himself. They sat him down hard enough to drive a grunt from his lungs. Well, Sister Tahira demanded, what is it? Zed once again leaned in, staring down at the round object sitting by itself in the center of the table. The faint blue and pink lines zigzagging all around it stirred deep feelings, he thought he should know this thing. It's... it's... It's what? Sister Tahira slammed the book against the edge of the table, causing the round object to bounce up and roll a few inches before it came to a stop closer to Zed. She tucked the book under one arm as she leaned with the other on the table. She bent down toward him. What is it? What does it do? I... I can't remember. Would you like me to bring in some children, the sister said in the soft, sweet tone of a very bitter threat, and show you their little faces before they are taken to the tent next to us to be tortured? I'm so tired, he said. I'm trying to remember, but I'm so tired. 
Maybe while the children are screaming, you would like to explain to their parents that you are tired and just can't quite seem to remember. Children. Parents. Zed suddenly remembered what the object was. Painful memories welled up. He felt a tear run down his cheek. Dear spirits, he whispered, where did you find this? What is it? Where did you find it? Zed repeated. Huffing impatiently, the sister straightened. She opened the book and made a noisy show of turning heatedly through the pages. Finally, she stopped and tapped a finger in the open book. It says here that it was found hidden in an open recess in the back of a black six-drawer chest in a corridor. There was a tapestry of three prancing white horses hanging above the chest. She lowered the book. Now, what is it? Zed swallowed. A ball. The sister glared. I know it's a ball, you old fool. What is it for? What does it do? What is its purpose? Staring at the ball no bigger than his fist, Zed remembered. It's a ball for children to play with. Its purpose is to bring them pleasure. He remembered this ball, brightly colored back then, frequently bouncing down the halls of the wizard's keep, his daughter giggling and chasing after it. He had given it to her for doing well in her studies. Sometimes she would roll it down the halls, urging it along with a switch, as if she were walking a pet. Her favorite thing to do was to bounce it on the floor so that it would come up against a wall, after which it would bounce to another wall at an intersection of stone hallways. In that way, she made it bounce around a corner. She would watch which hall it went down, left or right, then chase after it. One day, she came to him in tears. He asked her to tell him her troubles. She crawled up in his lap and told him that her ball had gone somewhere and gotten itself lost. She wanted him to get it unlost. Zed told her that if she looked, she would likely find it. She spent days despondently wandering the halls of the keep searching for it. She couldn't find it. Finally, starting out one morning at sunrise, Zed made the long walk down to the city of Aidendrill to the market on Stenter Street. That was when he had first come across a stand where they sold such toys and found the ball with the zigzagged lines. There he bought her another one, not just like it, but instead one with pink and green stars. He deliberately chose a ball unlike the one she'd lost because he didn't want her to think that wishes could be miraculously fulfilled, but he did want her to know that there were solutions that could solve problems. He remembered his daughter hugging his legs, thanking him for the new ball, telling him that he was the best father in all the world, and she would be ever so much more careful with the new ball and never lose it. He had smiled as he watched her put a little hand to her heart and recite a little girl oath she had invented on the spot. She treasured the ball with the pink and green stars. Since it was small, it was one of the few things she had been able to take with her after she was grown, when she and Zed ran away to Westland after Dark and Rawl had raped her. When Richard had been young, he had played with that ball. Zed remembered the smile on his daughter's face as she watched her own child play with that precious ball. Zed could see in her beautiful eyes the memories of her own childhood as she watched Richard play. She had kept that ball her whole life, kept it until she died. This ball before him was the very same one his daughter had lost. It must have bounced up behind the chest and fallen into a recess in the back where it had been for all those long years. Zed leaned forward, resting his forehead on the dusty ball surrounded with faded blue and pink zigzagged lines, the ball which her little fingers had once held, and wept. Sister Tahira seized a fistful of his hair and pulled him upright. I don't believe you're telling me the truth. It's an object of magic. I want to know what it is and what it does. Holding his head back, she glared into his eyes. You know that I will not hesitate to do what is necessary to make you cooperate. His Excellency accepts no excuses for failure. Zed stared up at her, blinking away his tears. It's a ball, a toy. That's all it is. With a sneer, she released him. The great and powerful wizard Zorander. She shook her head. To think that we once feared you. You are a pathetic old man 
your courage crushed by nothing more than the cry of a child. She sighed. I must say your reputation far exceeds the reality of your metal. The sister scooped up the ball, turning it in her fingers as she inspected it. She huffed with disgust and tossed it aside as if it were worthless. Zed watched the ball bounce and roll across the ground, coming to rest at the side of the tent against the bench where Addie sat. He looked up into her completely white eyes to see her watching him. Zed turned away, waiting while the sister made notes in her book. All right, she finally said. Let's go have a look at what they've unloaded in the next tent. The soldiers lifted him from the chair before he had a chance to try to do it himself. His shoulders ached from his wrists being bound behind his back and from being lifted by his arms. Addie, too, was lifted to her feet. The book snapped closed. Sister Tahira's wiry gray hair whipped around as she turned and led them out of the tent. Because the sisters knew how dangerous items of magic from the wizard's keep could be, especially if the wrong combination of magic were to accidentally be allowed to combine or touch, they were cautious enough to bring the items one at a time out of each individual protected shielded crate in the wagons. Zed knew that there were things in the keep that by themselves were not dangerous, but became so in the presence of other things that by themselves were also not dangerous. Sometimes it was only the combination of specific items that created a desired outcome. The sisters had vast experience in the most esoteric things of magic, and so they at least understood the principles involved. They treated the cargo with the care due such potentially hazardous goods. Once each object was uncrated, they placed it by itself in a tent to await examination. They took Zed and Addie from tent to tent so that Zed could identify each treasure, tell them what it was, explain how it worked. They had been at it for days. How many Zed couldn't remember. Despite his best efforts, the endless days and nights had all begun to melt together in his mind. Zed did all he could to stall, but there was only so much he could do. These women knew magic. They would not easily be fooled by any invented explanation. They had made very clear the consequences of any such deception. And Zed didn't know how much they knew. At times, they feigned ignorance of something which they actually understood quite well just to see if he was telling the truth. Fortunately, as of yet, they had uncovered nothing that was extravagantly dangerous. Most of the items from the crates were simple-looking objects, but were actually for a narrowly focused purpose. A pole that could remotely judge the depth of water in a well, an iron decoration shaped like a fan of leaves that prevented words from carrying beyond an open door where it was placed, a large looking glass that revealed when a person entered another room. While possibly useful to Emperor Jigang, such items were not all that valuable or dangerous. They were not going to help him to conquer and rule the world. What dangerous things the sisters had uncrated and shown him were not really anything that a sister couldn't easily produce with a spell of her own. The most dangerous item had been a constructed spell held within an ornate vase that, under specific conditions, such as when the vase was filled with water, created a temperature inversion that produced a blast of flame. Zed was not betraying his cause or putting innocent lives at risk by revealing how the spell worked. Any sister worth her salt could reproduce the same effect. The purpose of the spell was protective. Had it touched other stolen items, which because they were stolen was a reversal of intended ownership that such a spell recognized, it would have ignited and destroyed those items, keeping them from covetous hands. None of the things so far discovered would do Jagang any real good. There were things in the keep, though, that could cause him harm. There were spells there, such as the constructed spell in the vase, that recognized the nature of the person invoking their magic. Opened by the right person, such as Zed, those things would do nothing, but opened by a thief, they would create calamity. Page 513. The keep had thousands of rooms. The looting of it had netted the Imperial Order a caravan of cargo wagons, but even that much hardly scratched the surface of the contents of the keep. So far, 
Zed had not seen any plums. He didn't know if he would live to see any. The ride in the box after his capture had been brutal. He was still not recovered from the injuries inflicted after meeting Jagang. Guards let the parents do what they would to convince Zed and Addie to give in, but they wouldn't allow the parents to get so carried away that they killed such prize prisoners. The parents had known that they weren't to kill them, but in the heat of such raw passion, Zed knew that such orders were easy to forget. Zed yearned for them to kill him and end it. The emperor, though, needed them alive, so the guards stood careful watch. After the first few horrifying hours of listening to children being subjected to crippling torture, of being among their parents who understandably demanded quite forcefully that he cooperate and tell the emperor what he wanted to know, Zed had given in, not for the sake of the parents, so much as to stop those brutal men from what they were doing to the children. He had figured that he had nothing to lose, really, by giving in. It stopped the torture of the children for the time being. The keep was vast. The things they brought were only a tiny portion of them. Zed reasoned that the caravan of wagons probably didn't hold anything of any real value to Jagang. It would take quite a while to catalog everything. It would be weeks more before they reached the last item. There was no purpose in allowing children to endure torture when there might not be anything useful for Zed to betray to Jagang. Once, when they were alone while the sister had gone to check on the preparations in the next tent, Addy had asked what he would do if they presented him with something that would materially help Jagang win. Zed hadn't had a chance to answer. The soldiers had come in then and taken the two of them to the sister in the next tent. He was hoping to drag out the process for as long as possible. He hadn't counted on how they would keep at it day and night. It sometimes took quite a while for the sisters to get out the next treasure and have it ready. They were understandably cautious and took no chances. Those strange men without any trace of the gift who helped them might not be harmed if any errant item of magic were to accidentally be set in motion, but everyone else certainly was vulnerable. Careful as they were, there were enough people working at the preparations that Zed and Addie were not allowed to sleep for long before they were taken off to unravel the next puzzle for them. As he and Addie were dragged through the dark camp to the next tent, Zed's legs would hardly hold him. Seeing his daughter's long-lost ball had sapped much of his remaining strength. He had never felt so old, so feeble. He feared that his will to go on was flagging. He didn't know how much longer he could keep his sanity. He wasn't at all sure that he actually still possessed it. The world seemed to have turned into a crazy place. At times, the whole thing seemed dreamlike. What he knew and what he didn't know sometimes seemed to have all twisted together into a knot of confusion. As he was marched through the dark camp through the humid heat, he began to imagine that he saw things, mostly people, from his past. He began to doubt that he really had seen that ball. He wondered if, like some of the other things he was seeing, he had imagined it as well. Could it maybe have been a simple ball, and he only thought that it was the one his daughter had lost? Had he imagined the zigzagged colors around it? He was beginning to question himself over every little thing. Looking up at all the people in the crowded encampment, he thought he saw his long dead wife, Erilyn, in the faces of the women held nearby under guard. They were mothers, their worst nightmares ready to come to life if Zed didn't cooperate. His gaze passed over children clutching their mother's skirts or their father's legs. They looked at him, his wavy white hair in disarray, probably thinking he was some crazy man. Maybe he was. The torches lit the sprawling camp with a kind of flickering light that made everything seem imaginary. The campfires, spread as far as he could see, looked like a star field lying across the ground, as if the world had turned upside down. Wait, the sister said to the guards. Zed was jerked to a halt as the sister ducked inside the tent. Addie cried out as the man holding her wrenched her arm in the act of stopping her. Zed swayed on his feet, wondering if he might pass out. The whole nighttime camp wavered in his vision. As he looked at one of the girls held captive across the way, he stared astonished. 
thinking he recognized her. Zed looked up at the Emperor's elite guard in the distance holding the child. Zed blinked his blurred vision. The guard, in leather and mail armor with a belt full of weapons, looked like a man Zed used to know. Zed turned away at the memory, only to see a sister making her way among the tents not far away, who also looked like someone else he knew. He looked around at soldiers going about their business. Elite soldiers guarding the Emperor's compound looked like men he thought he remembered. Zed truly was terrified then. He was sure that he was losing his mind. He couldn't possibly be seeing the people he thought he saw. His mind was all he had. He didn't want to be some babbling old man sitting by the side of a road begging. He knew that people sometimes became irrational, lost their mind, when they got old or were pressed past their endurance. He had known people who had snapped, who had gone insane, and saw things that weren't really there. That's what he was doing. He was having visions of people from his past who weren't really there. That was a sure sign of insanity. Seeing your past come to life, thinking you were back with long lost loved ones. His mind was the most important thing he had. Now he was losing that too. He was losing his sanity. Chapter 50 Nicholas heard an annoying noise back in another place, a disturbance of some sort back where his body waited. He ignored it, watching the streets, watching the buildings go by. The sun had just set. People, wary people, moved past. Color, sound, activity. It was a dingy place with buildings crowded close. Watch, watch. Alleyways were dark and narrow. Strangers stared. The street smelled. None of the buildings were more than two stories. He was sure of it. Most were not even that. Again, he heard the noise back where his body waited. It was forceful, calling his attention. He ignored the thump, thump, thump back somewhere else as he watched, trying to see where they were going. What's this? Watch, watch, watch. He thought he knew, but he wasn't positive. Look. Look, he wanted to be sure, he wanted to watch. He so enjoyed watching. More noise, obnoxious, demanding, thumping noise. Nicholas felt his body around him as he slammed back to where it waited, sitting cross-legged on the wooden floor. He opened his eyes, blinking, trying to see in the dim room. Slivers of dusk leaking in around the edges of the closed shutters lent only somber light to the room. He stood, wavering on his feet for a moment, not yet used to the strange feeling of being back in his own body. He started walking across the room, looking down, watching as he lifted each foot out ahead, shifted his weight with every step. He had been gone so much lately, day and night, that he was not used to having to do such things on his own. He had been so often in another place, another body, that he had difficulty adjusting to his own. Someone was banging on the door, yelling for him to open it. Nicholas was furious at the uninvited caller, at such a rude intrusion. With wobbly gait, he made his way to the door. It felt so confining being back in his own body. It moved in such an odd manner. He rolled his shoulders, resisting the urge to bend forward. He pulled and stretched his neck one way, then the other. It was bothersome to have to move himself about to use his own muscles, to feel himself breathe, to see, hear, smell, feel with his own senses. The door was barred by a heavy bolt to prevent unwelcome callers from entering while he was off to other places. It wouldn't do to have someone messing with his body while he wasn't there using it himself. Wouldn't do at all. Someone pounding on the other side of the door bellowed his name and demanded to be let in. Nicholas lifted the heavy bolt and heaved it over. He threw open the thick door. A young soldier stood just outside in the hall, a common, grubby soldier, a nobody. Nicholas stared in stunned fury at the lowly man who would just walk up the stairs to the room everyone knew was off limits and pound on the forbidden door. Where was Najari's flat, crooked nose when he needed it? Why wasn't someone guarding the door? 
A broken bone jutted from the back of the bloody fist the man had been hammering against the door. Nicholas craned his neck, peering past the soldier out into the dimly lit hall, and saw the bodies of guards sprawled in pools of blood. Nicholas ran his fingernails back through his hair, shivering with delight at the silken smooth feel of oils gliding against his palm. He rolled his shoulders with the pleasure of the sensation. Opening his eyes, he fixed his gaze on the wide-eyed common soldier whom he was about to kill. The man was dressed like many of the Imperial Order soldiers, at least the better outfitted soldiers, with leather chest armor, a sleeve of protective mail on his right arm, and a number of leather straps and belts holding a variety of weapons, from a short sword to a mace with a spiked metal head to knives. Despite how deadly all his gear appeared, the expression on his face was one of startled terror. Nicholas puzzled for a moment at what such a meaningless man could possibly have to say that would be worth his life. What is it, you insipid fool? The man lifted an arm, then the hand, then a single finger in a manner that reminded Nicholas of nothing so much as a puppet having its strings pulled. The finger tipped to one side, then the other, then back again, the way someone might waggle a finger in admonition. Ah, 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 the finger twitched side to side again. Be polite, be awfully polite. The soldier, his eyes wide, seemed surprised by his own haughty words. The voice sounded too deep, too mature to belong to this young man. The voice, in fact, sounded dangerous to the extreme. What is this? Nicholas frowned at the soldier. What's this about? The man started into the room, his legs moving in a most peculiar, stilted manner. In some ways, it reminded Nicholas of how it must look when he used his own legs after not being in his body for a long spell. He stepped aside as the man walked woodenly into the center of the dim room and turned. Blood dripped from the hand that had been pounding against the door, but the man, his eyes still wide with fear, seemed not to notice what had to be painful injuries. His voice, though, came out anything but afraid. Where are they, Nicholas? Nicholas approached the man and cocked his head. They? You promised them to me, Nicholas. I don't like it when people don't keep their word. Where are they? Nicholas drew his brow down even farther, leaned in even more. Who? Richard Rawl and the Mother Confessor, the soldier bellowed in unrestrained rage. Nicholas backed away a few paces. He understood now. He had heard the stories, heard that the man could do such things. Now he was seeing it for himself. This was Emperor Jagang, the dreamwalker himself. Remarkable, Nicholas drawled. He approached the soldier, who was not a soldier, and tapped a finger against the side of the man's head. That you in there, Your Excellency? He tapped the man's temple again. That's you, isn't it, Excellency? Where are they, Nicholas? It was as dangerous sounding a question as Nicholas had ever heard. I told you that you would have them and you shall. I think you're lying to me, Nicholas, the voice growled. I don't think you have them, as you promised you would. Nicholas flipped a hand dismissively as he strolled off a few paces. Oh, foo, I have them by a string. I think otherwise. I have reason to believe that they aren't down here at all. I have reason to believe that the Mother Confessor herself is far to the north with her army. Nicholas frowned as he approached the man, leaning in close, peering into the eyes. Do you completely lose your senses when you go cavorting into another man's mind like that? Are you saying it isn't so? Nicholas was losing patience. I was just watching them when you barged in here to pester me. They were both there, Lord Rall and the Mother Confessor. Are you sure? came the deep gravelly voice out of the young soldier's mouth. Nicholas planted his fists on his hips. Are you questioning me? How dare you? I am Nicholas the Slide. I will not be questioned by anyone. 
The soldier took an aggressive step forward. Nicholas held his ground and lifted a finger in warning. If you want them, then you had better be awfully careful. The soldier watched with wide eyes, but Nicholas could see more in those eyes. Menace. Talk, then, before I lose my patience. Nicholas screwed his mouth up in annoyance. Whoever told you that they were to the north, that the Mother Confessor is here with their army, either doesn't know what they're talking about or is lying to you. I've kept a careful eye on them. But have you seen them lately? The room was growing dark. Nicholas cast a hand toward the table, sending a small spark of his gift into three candles there, setting their wicks to flame. I told you I was just watching them. They are in a city not far from here. Soon they will be coming here to me, and then I will have them. You don't have long to wait. What makes you think they're coming to you? I know everything they do. Nicholas held his arms aloft, his black robes slipping up to his elbows, gesturing expansively as he walked around the man, speaking of what he alone knew. I watch them. I have seen them lying together at night, the mother confessor tenderly holding her husband in her arms, holding his head to her shoulder, comforting his terrible pain. It's quite touching, actually. His pain? Yes, his pain. They are in Northwick right now, a city not far to the north of here. When they are finished there, if they live through their visit, then they will be coming here to me. Jagang and the soldier looked around, taking in the freshly dead bodies lying against the wall. His attention returned to Nicholas. I asked, what makes you think so? Nicholas looked over his shoulder and lifted an eyebrow at the emperor. Well, you see, these fool people here, the pillars of creation who so fascinate you, have poisoned the poor Lord Rao. They did it to try to ensure his help in getting rid of us. Poisoned him. Are you sure? Nicholas smiled at the note of interest he detected in the Emperor's voice. Oh, yes, quite sure. The poor man is in a great deal of pain. He needs an antidote. Then he will do what he must to get such an antidote. Richard Rall is a surprisingly resourceful man. Nicholas leaned his backside against the table and folded his arms. He may be resourceful, but he's now in a great deal of trouble. You see, he needs two more doses of the antidote. One of them is in Northwick. That's why he went there. You would be surprised at what that man can accomplish. It would have been impossible to miss the bristling anger in the Emperor's voice. You would be a fool to underestimate him, Nicholas. Oh, but I never underestimate anyone, Excellency. Nicholas smiled meaningfully at the Emperor, watching him through another man's eyes. You see, I'm reasonably sure that Richard Rall will retrieve the antidote in Northwick. In fact, I am counting on it. We shall see. I was watching him as you came in, watching what would happen. You spoiled it. But even if he obtains the antidote in Northwick, he will still need to get the last dose. The antidote in Northwick alone will not spare his life. Where's this other dose of his antidote? Nicholas reached in a pocket and showed the Emperor the square-sided bottle, along with a satisfied smile. I have it. The man with an Emperor inside him smiled. He may come to take it from you, Nicholas, but more likely he will have someone else make him more of the antidote so that he won't even have to bother coming here. Oh, I don't think so. You see, Excellency, I am quite thorough in my work. The poison that Lord Rall took is complex, but not nearly as complex as the antidote. I know because I had the only man who can make it tortured until he told me what it was, told me all about it, told me its secrets. It contains a whole list of things I couldn't even begin to recall. I had the man killed, of course. Then I had the man who tortured the confession out of him, tortured the antidote's list of ingredients out of him, killed as well. It wouldn't do to have the resourceful Richard Rall find either man and somehow discover from them what was in the cure. 
So you see, Excellency, there is no one to make Lord Rahl any more of the antidote. He held the bottle by the neck and wagged it before the man. This is the last dose, Lord Rahl's last chance at life. Through the eyes of a young soldier, Jagang watched the bottle Nicholas dangled before him. Any trace of humor had vanished. Then Richard Rahl will come here and get it. Nicholas pulled the cork. He took a whiff. The liquid inside carried the slight aroma of cinnamon. You think so, Excellency? Making a great show of it, Nicholas poured the liquid out onto the floor. As Emperor Jagang watched, Nicholas shook the bottle, making sure that the very last drop fell out. So you see, Excellency, I have everything well in hand. Richard Rahl will not be a problem. He will shortly die from the poison, if my men don't manage to get him before then. Either way, Richard Rahl is a dead man, just as you requested. Nicholas bowed, as if at the conclusion of a grand performance before an appreciative audience. The man smiled again, a smile of strained forbearance. And what of the mother confessor? the emperor asked. Nicholas noted the clear undertone of restrained wrath. He was displeased not to be roundly admired for his great accomplishment. After all, this emperor Jagang had not managed to capture the prize he so keenly sought. Nicholas smiled indulgently. Well, the way I see it, Excellency, now that I've told you Lord Rahl is soon to join the ranks of the Keeper's flock in the underworld, I have no assurance that you will keep your part of the bargain. I would like a commitment on your part before I give you the Mother Confessor. What makes you think you can capture her? Oh, I have that well in hand. Her own nature will deliver her into my hands. Her own nature? Let me worry about that, Excellency. All you need know is that I will deliver the Mother Confessor to you, alive as promised. You might say that Lord Rahl was free, a gift on my part, but you will have to pay the price if you are to have the prize you covet, the Mother Confessor. And what would be your price? Nicholas strolled around the man in the center of the room. He gestured with the empty antidote bottle at the surroundings. Not my idea of the proper way to live, if one has to live. So you would have riches as a reward for doing your duty to the Creator, to the Imperial Order, and to your Emperor. The way Nicholas saw it, he had done more than his duty that night in the woods with the sisters. Instead of saying so, he shrugged. Well, I will let you have the rest of the world you have fought so hard to gain. I only want Dahara an empire of worth for my own. You wish to rule the land of Dahara? Nicholas performed an exaggerated bow. Under you, of course, Excellency, he straightened. I will rule as you do, through fear and terror, all in the name of sacrificing for the betterment of mankind. The dreamwalker watched through the eyes of the frightened soldier. The glint in those eyes was looking dangerous again. You play a risky game, Slide, making such demands. Your life must mean little to you. Nicholas showed the emperor a smile that said he was tiring of trifling. Hate to live, live to hate. Finally, the emperor's smile returned to the man's lips. Dahara is your wish. It is done. Lord Raoul dead and the mother confessor delivered to me alive, and you will then have Dahara to do with as you wish as long as you pay homage to the rule of the Imperial Order. Nicholas indulged Jagang with a more polite smile as he bowed his head. But of course. Then when Richard Rahl is dead and I have the Mother Confessor, you shall be named Emperor Nicholas of the land of Dahara. You are a wise emperor. This was the man who had prescribed Nicholas's fate. This was the man who had sent those sisters to practice their vile craft to sunder him with the terrible agony of destroying who he had been, to mother him in an agonizing second creation. They had decreed that he sacrifice himself to their cause. Nicholas had had no say in it. Now, at least, for the small task of dealing with the petty enemies of the order, he would have his reward. He would have riches and power that he could never have dared imagine before he had been reborn. 
They had destroyed him, but they had created him again more powerful than he had ever been. Now he was but one step away from being Emperor Nicholas. It had been a bitter road. Driven by angry need, by hatred, Nicholas thrust out his hand as he thrust his own mind like a hot dagger into the mind of this man before him, into the spaces between his thoughts, into the marrow of his soul. He hungered to feel the slick heat of this other spirit slide into his own, the hot rush of taking him while Jagang was still within the man's mind. But there was nothing there. In that spark of time, Jagang had already slipped away. The man crashed to the floor, dead. Nicholas, Emperor Nicholas, smiled at the game only just begun. He was beginning to wonder if he had set the price too low. Chapter 51 As they made their way up the street, Kalin glanced to the small windows in the surrounding buildings. In the gathering darkness, she doubted that the faces she saw peering out of the windows could tell much about the people they saw out in the street, but she pulled the hood of her cloak forward anyway. From the stories the men had told, it was not safe to be a woman in Bondakar, so Kalin, Jensen, and Kara covered their identity to draw as little attention as possible. Kalin knew that people in fear for their own lives sometimes tried to shift attention away from themselves by offering another to the wolves. Worse, she also knew that there were bitter people devoted to the morbid ideal of the perpetual cannibalism of appeasement that they defined as peace. Richard slowed and checked the alley as they passed. One hand gripped the front of his simple black cloak so that, if need be, he could lift it open and draw his sword. Their men were spread out so as not to appear to be a mob moving through Northwick. Any gathering of crowds of men, except in markets, would no doubt be reported and swiftly draw the attention of the Imperial Order soldiers. They had timed their entry into the city to be just as night fell so as to better obscure them, yet not so late that their presence on the streets would be suspicious. There, Owen said as they reached the corner, tilting his head to the right. Down that way. Richard looked back over his shoulder to make sure that everyone was still with him, then turned down the narrow street. The buildings in the city were mostly single story, but they were entering a district where a number had a second story, usually hanging several feet out over the street. Kalin saw nothing taller than the squat two-story buildings. The area they had turned into reeked with the stench of sewage in a shallow ditch to the side. The dusty streets of Northwick kept making her cough. She imagined that when it rained, the place turned into a quagmire that stank even worse. She saw that Richard made a great effort not to cough. It wasn't always possible. At least when he did, he wasn't coughing up blood. As they kept to the shadows, in under the overhangs and eaves, Kalin moved up closer to him, Jensen following right behind. Anson, out ahead, scouted their route, looking for all the world as though he were by himself. Richard scanned the sky again. It was empty. They hadn't seen any black-tipped races since before they started up the pass into Bandakar. Kalin and Kara were glad not to see the huge black birds. Richard, though, seemed as troubled by not seeing them as he once was when he did. Kara hung back a bit, along with a half dozen men. Tom and some others were moving up a parallel street. Yet other men who knew where they were headed made their way through the city by a different route. Even though there were less than 50 in their force, such numbers together could bring attention and trouble. For now, they didn't need trouble. They needed the antidote. Where is the city center? Kalin asked Owen when she got close enough to be able to speak in a low voice. Owen swept his arm around, indicating the street they were on. This is the place. These shops are where the major commerce is, where people come. In the open squares, the people sometimes set up markets. Kalin saw a leather shop, a bakery, a place that sold cloth, but nothing more elaborate. This is the center of your great city? These post and beam buildings with living quarters over the shops? This is your major business center? Yes, Owen said, sounding half puzzled and half proud. Kalin let out a sigh, but didn't comment. Richard did. 
This is the result of your advanced culture? He gestured around at the shabby daub and wattle buildings. In close to 3,000 years, this is what your great culture has accomplished? This is what you have managed to build? Owen smiled. Yes, it is magnificent, is it not? Instead of answering the question, Richard said, I thought you were in all tour wrong. I was? Well, even that dingy place was far more advanced than this city of Northwick. It was? I am sorry, Lord Rawl, but I didn't see much of Alto Arang. I was afraid to go far into such a place, and I did not stay for long. Owen looked back at Kalin. Do you mean to say that the city where you are from is more magnificent than this one? Kalin blinked at the man. How could she possibly explain Aidendril, the wizard's keep, the confessor's palace, the palaces on King's Row, the people's palace? the marble and granite work, the soaring columns, the noble works of art, or any of a hundred other places and sites to a man who thought straw and dung buildings were an example of advanced culture. In the end, she decided that this was not the time to try. Owen, I hope that when we are all free of the oppression of the Imperial Order, Richard and I can show you and your people some other places in the world outside of Bandakar, show you some other centers of major commerce and art some of what mankind elsewhere has accomplished. Owen smiled. I would like that, Mother Confessor. I would like it very much. He stopped abruptly. Oh, here is the place. It is down here. A head-high wooden gate, weathered to a brownish gray, barred the alleyway beyond from sight. Richard checked both ways up the street, looking to see if anyone was watching. The street was empty of everyone but their men, as he kept an eye to the street, he pushed the gate open enough to allow Owen to slip through. Owen poked his head back out. Come, it is clear. Richard gave a hand signal to the men up at the corner. He put his arm around Kalin's waist, holding her close as he squeezed with her through the gate into the alley. The walls of the buildings on either side that came to the edge of the narrow, dusty alleyways had no windows. Some of the tightly packed structures that weren't set so far back had room for small backyards. As they moved cautiously up the alley, more of their men poured in through the gate at the far end. Chickens penned in one of the yards flapped their wings in fright at the people moving close by. Jensen pulled Betty along by her rope, keeping the goat close so she couldn't cause any trouble. Betty remained quiet, seeming nervous in the strange surroundings of a city. She wasn't even wagging her tail as she peered up at Richard, Kalin, and Jensen for reassurance as they moved deeper into the heart of the jumble of buildings. Tom appeared at the other end of the alleyway, bringing another group of men. Richard signaled for them to spread out and wait at that end of the alley. Kara came up from behind, the hood of her cloak pulled up like Kalin's and Jensen's. I don't like it. Good, Richard whispered in answer. Good, Kara asked. You think it's good that I don't like this place? Yes, Richard said. If you were ever happy and unconcerned, then I'd be worried. Kara twisted her mouth with a reply she decided to keep to herself. Here, Owen said, grabbing Richard's arm to stop him. Richard looked where Owen had pointed and then stared down at the man. This is a palace. Owen nodded. One of them. We have several palaces. I told you we are an advanced culture. Richard gave Kalin a sidelong glance, but said nothing. From what Kalin could see in the dim light, the backyard was dry dirt with clumps of grass growing here and there. A wooden stairway at the back of the building led up to a small balcony with a door onto the second floor. As they passed through a short gate into the yard, Kalin saw that under the stairs there was a stairwell going down. Owen looked around, then leaned close. They are downstairs. This is where they are hiding the wise one. Richard scanned the alley and the surrounding buildings. He rubbed his fingertips across his brow. And the antidote is in there? Owen nodded. Do you wish to wait while I go get it? Richard shook his head. We'll go with you. Kalin held his arm, wishing she could do more to comfort his pain. The best thing, though, was to get the antidote. The sooner they rid him of the poison, the sooner he could deal with solving the problem of the headaches caused by the gift. Some of the men waited nearby. 
She saw in their eyes their fear of being back in a city where the Imperial Order soldiers had control. She didn't know what she and Richard could do to help them free their people of those troops, but she intended to come up with something. Were it not for her desperate act, no matter how unwitting, these people would not be suffering and dying at the hands of the Order. The last gray glow of twilight made Richard's eyes look as if they were made of steel. He pulled Jensen close. Why don't you and Tom stay out here with Betty and stand watch? Stay under the concealment of the stairs and balcony. If you see any soldiers, come let us know. Jensen nodded. I'll let Betty graze on the grass. It would look more natural if any patrols pass by. Just keep out of sight, he said. If soldiers see a young woman like you, they won't hesitate to snatch you. I'll keep her out of sight, Tom said as he came up into the yard. He aimed a thumb over his shoulder. I have the men spread out so they won't be so noticeable. Kalen and Kara followed Richard and Owen toward the back of the building. At the stairwell down, Owen paused when Richard instead went to the door into the building. This way, Lord Rall. I know. Wait while I check the hallway inside. Make sure it's clear. It is just empty rooms where people sometimes meet. I want to check it anyway. Kara, wait here with Kalen. Kalen followed Richard to the door under the balcony. I'm going with you. Kara was right on Kalen's heels. If you want to check the hall, she told Richard, then you may come with us. After a quick glance at Kalen's eyes, he didn't argue with her. Looking at Kara, he said, Sometimes. Kara flashed him a defiant smile. You wouldn't know what to do without me. Kalen saw that as he turned to the door, he couldn't help but smile. Her heart lifted at seeing Richard's smile, and then she felt a sudden pang of sorrow for Kara, knowing how she must miss General Meifert with their army far to the north in Dahara. It wasn't often that a moored Sith could come to care about someone the way Kalen knew Kara cared about Benjamin. Kara wouldn't come out and admit it, though, and had put first her wish to protect Richard and Kalen. When she and Kara had been back with that army, Kalen had promoted the then captain to general after a battle in which they had lost a number of officers. Captain Meifert had risen to the occasion. Since then, he had held the army together. While she had complete faith in him, she also feared for his well-being, as Kara certainly must. Kalen wondered if they would ever again see the young general. Richard opened the door a crack and peered into the dark hallway beyond. It was empty. Kara, a geel in hand, pushed through and entered ahead of them, wanting to be sure that it was safe. Kalen followed Richard in. There were two doors to each side. At the far end of the hall stood a door with a small window. What's out there? Kalen whispered as Richard looked through the window. The street. I see some of our men. On the way back, Richard checked rooms on one side while Kara checked the rooms on the other. They were all empty, just as Owen had said. This might be a good place to hide our men, Kara said. Richard nodded. That's what I was thinking. We could make strikes from here, from their midst, rather than risk being spotted coming in from the countryside to attack. Before they reached the back door, Richard suddenly stumbled, banging a shoulder against the wall before going to one knee. Kalen and Kara grabbed for him, keeping him from falling on his face. What's wrong? Kara whispered. He paused a moment, apparently waiting for a bout of pain to lift. His fingers squeezing Kalen's arm hurt so much that her eyes were watering, but she made herself remain silent. I just... just got dizzy for a minute. He panted, trying to recover his breath. The dark hall, I guess. His fingers released their vice-like grip on Kalen's arm. The second state, that's what Owen called it. He said that the second state of the poison was dizziness. Richard looked up at her in the dark. I'm all right. Let's go get the antidote. Owen, waiting in the shadows in the stairwell, started down when they reached him. At the bottom of the stairs, he pushed the door open and looked in. They are still here, he said with relief. The speakers are still here. I recognize some of their voices. The wise one must still be here with them. They have not moved to another hiding place as I feared they might. Owen was hoping the great speakers would agree to help rid their people of the Imperial Order. 
After they had refused in the past, Kalin didn't think they would agree this time. But then Owen and his men had not at first agreed to fight. Owen believed that with the commitment of the men they had, and with what had happened in his town, the assembly of speakers would see that there was a chance of being free again and would be more open to hearing what had to be done. Many of the men shared Owen's confidence that help was at hand. More important than talking to the speakers, as far as Kalin was concerned, was that this was where the second bottle of antidote was hidden. That came above all else. They had to secure the antidote. Whenever she thought about the possibility of Richard dying, it made her knees tremble. Just inside the small vestibule, Owen rapped gently on the door. Soft candlelight came from inside when the door pulled in a crack. A man peered out for a moment, then his eyes went wide. Owen? Kalin didn't think the man intended to open the door. Before he had a chance to think it over, Richard pushed the door open and moved into the room. The man hastily backed out of Richard's way. Richard pulled Kara close. Guard the door. None of these people comes out unless I say so. Kara nodded and took up a position outside the door. What is the meaning of this? The man inside demanded of Owen as he gaped in fear at Richard and Kalin. Great speaker, it is vital that we speak with all of you. The place was aglow with candles. A dozen and a half men sitting around on rugs, sipping tea or leaning against pillows lining the walls abruptly fell silent. The stone walls were the outer foundation of the building. Stone piers marched in two lines down the center of the large room, supporting fat beams far above Richard's head. There was no decoration. It looked like little more than a basement made comfortable with rugs and pillows where the men congregated at one end of the extensive room. Simple wooden tables against the walls at one end held candles. Some of the men rose to their feet. Owen, one of them said in grave reprimand, you have been banished. What are you doing here? Honored speaker, we are well past petty issues of banishment. Owen held out an introductory hand. These are friends of mine from outside our land. Kalin grabbed Owen's shirt at the shoulder and pulled his ear close as she gritted her teeth. Antidote. Owen nodded apologetically. The men, all older, watched indignantly as Owen went to the corner at the far right. He grasped a stone near chest height and twisted it side to side. Richard reached in and helped Owen wiggle the stone loose. When he finally pulled the heavy block out far enough to turn it to the side, Owen reached in behind and came out with the bottle. He wasted no time in handing it to Richard. When Richard pulled the cork, Kalin detected the slight aroma of cinnamon. Richard downed the contents. You must leave, one of the men growled. You are not welcome here. Owen didn't back down. We must see the wise one. What? The men of the order have invaded our land. They are torturing and murdering our people. Others they have taken away. Nothing can be done about this, the red-faced speaker said. We do as we must so that our people can go on with their lives. We do as we must to avoid violence. We have ended violence, Owen told the man, at least in our town. We killed all the men of the order who held us in the grip of fear, who raped and tortured and murdered our people. Our people there are now free of these men of the order. We must fight back and free the rest of our people. It is your duty as speakers to do right by our people and not accommodate their enslavement. The great speakers were apoplectic. We will hear none of this. We will speak of it with the wise one and see what he has to say. No, the wise one will not see you, never. You are all denied. You must all leave. Chapter 52 One of the men came forward and angrily seized a fistful of Richard's shirt, trying to push him out. You are the cause of this. You are an outsider, a savage, one of the unenlightened. You have brought profane ideas among our people. He did his best to shake Richard. You have seduced our people to violence. Richard snatched the speaker's wrist and wrenched his arm around, taking him to his knees. The man cried out in pain. Without letting up, Richard leaned down toward him. We have risked our lives helping your people. Your people are not enlightened, but people the same as anyone else. You are going to listen to us. 
This night, the future of you and your people will be shaped. Richard released the man with a shove, then went to the door and stuck his head out. Kara, go ask Tom to help you get all the rest of the men to come down here. I think they had better all be part of this. As Kara ran to spread the word that Richard wanted all the men to gather into the basement of the palace, he ordered the speakers back against the wall. You have no right to do this, one protested. You are the representatives of the people of Vandekar. You are their leaders, Richard told them. The time has come for you to lead. Behind, men started filing into the candlelit room. It wasn't long before they were all quietly assembled. The basement was large enough that Owen's men took up only part of the available space. Kalen saw other unfamiliar people straggle in as well. Knowing the nature of these people, and since Kara was letting them in, Kalen didn't think that they presented a threat. Richard gestured toward the quiet gathering, watching the speakers. These men from the town of Witherton have faced the truth of what is happening to their people. They will no longer tolerate such brutality. They will no longer be victims. They wish to be free. One of the speakers, a man with a narrow pointed chin, huffed dismissively. Freedom can never work. It only gives people license to be self-centered. A thoughtful person dedicated to the welfare of an enlightened mankind must reject the immoral concept of freedom for what it is, selfish. That's right, another agreed. Such simplistic beliefs can only provoke a cycle of violence. This silly notion of freedom leads to viewing things as black or white. Such uninspired morals are obsolete. Individuals have no right to judge others, especially in such authoritarian terms. What is needed is compromise among all sides if there is to be peace. Compromise, Richard asked. A cycle of violence can only exist if you grant all people, including those who are evil, moral equivalents. If you say that everyone, including those who decide to harm others, has an equal right to exist. That is what you do when you refuse to crush evil. You give moral standing and power to those who murder. Devotion to compromise in such arenas is a sick idea that says you must cut off a finger and then a leg and then an arm to feed the monster living among you evil feeds on the good. If you kill the monster, the violence ends. You have two choices before you. Choose to live in cringing fear on your knees, apologizing endlessly for wishing to be allowed to live as you struggle to appease an ever-expanding evil, or eliminate those who would harm you and free yourselves to live your own lives, which means you must remain vigilant, ever ready to protect yourself. One of the speakers, his eyes going wide, lifted an arm to point at Richard. I know you now. You are the one who is named in prophecy. You are the one that prophecy says will destroy us. Whispers carried the accusation back through the crowd. Richard gazed back at his gathered men, then directed a withering glare at the speakers. I am Richard Rawl. You're right. I am the one named in the prophecy given to your people so long ago. Your destroyer will come, and he will redeem you. You're right. This prophecy is about me. But if I had not come along, it would eventually have been another who would have fulfilled those words, whether in another year or another thousand years, because these words are really about man's honorable commitment to life. Your people were banished because they refused to see the truth of the world around them. They chose to close their minds to reality. I have ended that blindness. Richard pointed back at the men with him. When the truth was put before these men, they chose at last to open their eyes and see it. Now the rest of your people must meet the same challenge and make a choice as to how they will live their future. Your destroyer will come and he will redeem you are words of the potential for a better future. They mean that your way of life, of impeding people from being their best, of restricting them from being all that they can be, of your blind, destructive ways that crush the spirit of each individual and over time have caused so many of the best of your people to abandon you and go into the unknown beyond the boundary, is ended. The men of the order may have invaded your land, but spiritually they change nothing for you. Their violence is merely more apparent than your slow suffocation of human potential. They offer the same unseeing lives you already live, 
simply with a more manifest form of brutality. I have brought the light of truth to some of your people, and in so doing I have destroyed their dark existence. The rest of your people must now decide if they will continue to cower in darkness or come into the light I have brought among you. In bringing that light to your people, I have redeemed them. I have shown them that they can soar on their own wings, aspire to reach for what they want for themselves. I have helped them take back their own lives. Yes, I have destroyed the pretext that is the chains of their repression, but in so doing, I have freed the nobility of their spirits. That is the meaning of the prophecy. It is up to each of you to rise to the occasion and seek to triumph, or to hide in your self-imposed darkness without trying. There is no guarantee that if you try, you will succeed. But without trying, you will assure failure and lives of dread for yourselves and your children. The only difference will be that if you choose to live the same as you do now, if you continue to appease evil, you will now know that it's at the price of your soul. Richard turned away from the speakers. Before he closed his eyes to rub them with his fingertips, Kaylin saw the terrible agony in those eyes. She wanted nothing more than to get to the last antidote and then to do what they must to rid him of the pain caused by his gift. She knew she was slowly losing him. It seemed to her as if Richard were somewhere all alone, dangling from the edge of a cliff, holding on by his fingertips, and his fingers were slowly slipping. Owen stepped forward. Honored speakers, the time has come to hear from the wise one. If you do not think this crisis for our people warrants it, then nothing does. This is our future, our lives, that are at stake. Bring out the wise one. We will hear his words, if he truly is wise and worthy of our loyalty. After noting the murmurs of agreement throughout the room, the speakers put their heads together, whispering among themselves to find a consensus that would tell them what to do. Finally, about half of them went off into a back room. One of the remaining speakers bowed his bald head. We will see what the wise one has to say. Kalin had seen such contemptuous smiles often enough. Lifting his pointed chin, he serenely clasped his hands before himself. Before all these people, we will put your blasphemous words to the wise one and hear his wisdom so that this matter may be put to rest. Men emerged from the back room carrying posts draped with red cloth, notched boards, and planks. Before the door into a back room, they began assembling a simple platform with posts at each corner and the heavy red drapes designed to enclose it. When the structure was finally completed, they placed a large pillow on the platform and then drew the drapes together. Other men carried over two tables holding a number of candles and placed one on each side of the draped ceremonial seat of wisdom. In short order, the speakers had created a simple but reverent setting. Kaylin knew a number of people in the Midlands who had magic and functioned in the capacity she imagined that this wise one did. They also usually had attendants, such as these speakers. She also knew better than to underestimate such simple shamans and their link to the spirit world. There were those who had very real connections and very real power over their people. What she couldn't imagine was how a people without any magic whatsoever could have such an agent of the spirits. If it was true that they did and such a person went against them, then all their work would have been for nothing. The speakers lined up to either side and then drew the curtains in the front just enough to see into the dim interior. There, sitting cross-legged on the pillow, was what appeared to be a boy in white robes, his hands resting prayerfully in his lap. He didn't look very old, maybe eight or ten at most. A black scarf was tied around his head to cover his eyes. He's just a boy, Richard said. At the interruption, one of the speakers shot Richard a murderous glare. Only a child is innocent enough of the contamination of life to be free to touch true wisdom. As we grow older, we layer our experiences over our once perfect insight, but we remember those once unadulterated connections, and so we realize how only in a child can wisdom itself be so pure. Heads throughout the room bobbed knowingly. Richard cast a sidelong glance at Kalin. One of the speakers knelt before the platform and bowed his bald head. Wise one, 
We must ask your knowing guidance. Some of our men wish to begin a war. War solves nothing, the wise one said in a pious voice. Perhaps you would like to hear his reasons. There are no valid reasons for fighting. War is never a solution. War is an admission of failure. The people in the room shrank back, looking ill at ease to have brought such crude inquiries before the wise one. Inquiries he had no trouble untangling with simple wisdom that laid bare obvious immorality. Very wise. You have shown us wisdom in its true, simple perfection. All men would do well to heed such truth. The man bowed his head again. We have tried to tell, Why are you wearing a blindfold? Richard asked, cutting off the speaker kneeling before the platform. I hear anger in your voice, the wise one said. Nothing can be accomplished until you shed your hate. If you search with your heart, you can find the good in everyone. Richard put a hand on Owen's back, urging him ahead. He reached back into the crowd of men and grabbed a pinch of Anson's shirt, pulling him forward as well. The three men moved up to the wise one's platform. Only Richard stood tall. With his foot, he forced the kneeling speaker aside. I asked why you're wearing a blindfold, Richard said. Knowledge must be denied so as to make room for faith. It is only through faith that real truth can be reached, the wise one said. You must believe before you can see. If you believe without seeing the truth of what is, Richard said, then you're simply being willfully blind, not wise. You must see first in order to learn and understand. The men around Kalin looked uncomfortable that Richard was speaking in this way to their wise one. Stop the hate, or you reap only hate. We were talking about knowledge. I haven't asked you about hate. The wise one put his hands together prayerfully before him, bowing his head slightly. Wisdom is all around us, but our eyes blind us, our hearing deafens us, our minds think and so make us ignorant. Our senses only trick us. The world can tell us nothing of the nature of reality. To be at one with the greater essence of the true meaning of life, you must first stare blindly inward to discover truth. Richard folded his arms over his chest. I have eyes so I can't see. I have ears so I can't hear. I have a mind so I can't know anything. The first step to wisdom is to accept that we are inadequate to know the nature of reality and so nothing we think we know can be real. We must eat to live. How is one to track a deer in the woods so you can eat? Blindfold yourself? Stuff wax in your ears? Do it while you're asleep so your mind won't contribute any thinking to the task at hand? We do not eat meat. It is wrong to harm animals just so that we might eat. We have no more right to live than an animal. So you eat only plants, eggs, cheese, things like that? Of course. How do you make cheese? In the awkward silence, someone in the back of the room coughed. I am the wise one. I have not been called upon to do this work. Others make cheese for us to eat. I see. You don't know how to make cheese for your dinner because no one has ever taught you. That's perfect. Here you are then, blindfolded and with a clear mind, not all clogged up with troublesome knowledge on the subject. So, how do you make cheese? Is it coming to you? Is the method of making cheese being sent to you through your blindfolded divine introspection? Reality cannot be tested. Tell me how, if you were to wear a blindfold so you couldn't see, put wax in your ears so you couldn't hear, and put on heavy mittens so you couldn't feel anything, how you would even do something as simple as picking a radish to eat. Tell you what, you can leave the wax out of your ears and not bother with the mittens. Just leave that blindfold on and show me how you can pick a radish so you have something to eat. I'll even help you find the door first. Then you're on your own. Come on, then. Off you go. The wise one licked his lips. Well, I... If you deny yourself sight, hearing, touch, how will you plant food to sustain your life? Or how can you even hunt for berries and nuts? If nothing is real, then how long until you starve to death while you wait for some inner voice of truth to feed you? One of the speakers rushed forward, trying to push Richard back. 
Richard shoved the man so hard that it sat him on the ground. The speakers cowered back a few paces. Richard put one boot up on the platform, laid his arm across his knee, and leaned close to the wise one. Answer my questions, wise one. Tell me what staring blindly inwardly has so far revealed to you about making cheese. Come on, let's hear it. But it's not a fair question. Oh? A question regarding the pursuit of a value is not fair? Life requires all living things to successfully pursue values if they are to continue to live. A bird dies if it can't succeed at catching a worm. It's basic. People are no different. Stop the hate. You already have on a blindfold. Why don't you plug your ears and hum a tune to yourself so you won't be thinking about anything? Richard leaned in and lowered his voice dangerously. And in your state of infinite wisdom, wise one, just try to guess what I'm about to do to you. The boy squealed in fright and scooted back. Kaylin pushed her way between Richard and Anson and sat back on the platform. She put an arm around the terrified boy and pulled him close to comfort him. He pressed himself into her sheltering protection. Richard, you're scaring the poor boy. Look at him. He's shaking like a leaf. Richard pulled the blindfold off the boy's head. In confused dismay, he peered fearfully up at Richard. Why did you go to her? Richard asked in a gentle tone. Because you were about to hurt me. You mean then that you were hoping she would protect you? Of course. You're bigger than me. Richard smiled. Do you see what you're saying? You were frightened and you hoped to be protected from danger. That wasn't wrong of you, was it? To want to be safe? To fear aggression? To seek help from someone you thought might be big enough to stop the threat? The boy looked confused. No, I guess not. And what if I held a knife to you? Wouldn't you want to have someone prevent me from cutting you? Wouldn't you want to live? The boy nodded. Yes. That's the value we're talking about here. He frowned. What do you mean? Life, Richard said. You want to live. That is noble. You don't want someone else to take your life. That is just. All creatures want to live. A rabbit will run if threatened. That's why he has strong legs. He doesn't need the strong legs or big ears to find and eat tender shoots. He has the big ears to listen for threats and the strong legs to escape. A buck will snort in warning if threatened. A snake may shake a rattle to ward off threats. A wolf growls a warning. But if the danger keeps coming and they can't escape, a buck may trample it, the snake may strike, and the wolf may attack. None of them will go looking for a fight, but they will protect themselves. Man is the only creature who willingly submits to the fangs of a predator. Only man, through continual indoctrination such as you've been given, will reject the values that sustain life. Yet you instinctively did the right thing in going to my wife. I did? Yes. Your ways couldn't protect you, so you acted on the chance that she might. If I really were someone intent on harming you, she would have fought to stop me. He looked up into Kalen's smile. You would? Yes, I would. I too believe in the nobility of life. He stared in wonder. Kalen slowly shook her head. But your instinctive act of seeking protection would have done you no good had you instead sought the protection of people who live by the misguided teachings you repeat. Those teachings condemn self-preservation as a form of hate. Your people are being slaughtered with the aid of their own beliefs. He looked stricken. But I don't want that. Kalen smiled. Neither do we. That's why we came, and why Richard had to show you that you can know the truth of reality, and doing so will help you survive. Thank you, he said to Richard. Richard smiled and gently smoothed down the boy's blonde hair. Sorry I had to frighten you to show you that what you were saying didn't really make any sense. I needed to show you that the words you've been taught can't serve you well. You can't live by them because they are devoid of reality and reason. You look to me like a boy who cares about living. I was like that when I was your age, and I still am. Life is wonderful. Take delight in it. Look around with the eyes you have and see it in all its glory. No one has ever talked to me about life in this way. I don't get to see much. 
I have to stay inside all the time. Tell you what, maybe before I go, I can take you for a walk in the woods and show you some of the wonders of the world around you. The trees and plants, birds, maybe we'll even see a fox. And we'll talk some more about the wonders and joy of life. Would you like that? The boy's face lit up with a grin. Really? You would do that for me? Richard smiled one of those smiles that so melted Kalen's heart. He playfully pinched the boy's nose. Sure. Owen came forward and ran his fingers affectionately through the boy's hair. I was once like you, a wise one, until I got a little older than you. The boy frowned up at him. Really? Owen nodded. I used to think that I had been chosen because I was special, and somehow only I was able to commune with some glorious otherworldly dominion. I believed that I was gushing great wisdom. Looking back, I am ashamed to see how foolish it all was. I was made to listen to lessons. I was never allowed to be a boy. The great speakers praised me for repeating back the things I had heard, and when I spoke then with great scorn to people, they told me how wise I was. Me too, the boy said. Richard turned back to the men. This is what your people have been reduced to as a source of wisdom, listening to children repeating meaningless expressions. You have minds in order to think and understand the world around you. This self-imposed blindness is a dark treason to yourselves. The men in front that Kaylin could see from where she sat holding the boy all hung their heads in shame. Lord Rall is right, Anson said, turning back to the men. Until today, I never actually questioned it or thought about how foolish it really is. One of the speakers shook his fist. It is not foolish. Another, the one with the pointed chin, leaned in and snatched Anson's knife from the sheath at his belt. Kaylin could hardly believe what she had just seen. It felt as if she were watching a nightmare suddenly unfold, a nightmare she wasn't able to stop or even slow. It seemed she knew what was going to happen before she saw it. With an enraged cry, the speaker suddenly struck out, stabbing Anson before he could react. Kalin heard the blade hit bone. Driven by blind rage, the speaker swiftly drew back the fist holding the now bloody knife to stab Anson again. Anson's face twisted in shock as he began going down. Points of candlelight reflected off the polished length of razor-sharp steel blurred into streaks as Richard's sword flashed past Kalin. Even as the sword swept around, the unique ring of steel as it had been drawn accompanied its terrifying arc toward the threat. Driven by Richard's formidable strength, the tip of the sword whistled through the air. As the speaker's arm reached the apex of its swing, as it once more began a deadly journey down, Richard's blade slammed into the side of the speaker's neck and without seeming to slow in the least, ripped through flesh and bone, cleaving off the man's head and one shoulder along with the arm holding high the knife. The lightning slash threw long strings of blood against the stone wall of the foundation of the palace of the Bandakar Empire. As the speaker's head and the one shoulder with the arm attached tumbled through the air in an odd wobbly spiral, his body collapsed in a heap. The head smacked the floor with a sickening thud and bounced across the carpets, leaving a trail of blood as it tumbled. Richard swept the crimson blade around, directing it toward the potential threat of the other speakers. Kalin pressed the boy's face to her shoulder, covering his eyes. Some of the men fell in around Anson. Kalin didn't know how badly he was hurt, or if he was even still alive. Not far away, the gory head and the arm of the dead speaker lay before a table set with candles. The fist still held the knife in a death grip. The sudden carnage lying there before them all, the blood spreading across the floor was horrifying. Everyone stared in stunned silence. The first blood drawn by you great speakers, Richard said in a quiet voice to the cluster of cringing speakers, is not against those who come to murder your people but against a man who committed no violence against you. One of your own who simply stood up and told you that he wanted to be free of the oppression of terror, free to think for himself. Kalin stood and saw then that there were far more people in the room than there had been before. Most were not their men. When Kara made her way through the silent throng to Kalin's side, Kalin took her by the arm and leaned close. 
Who are all those people? The people from the city. Runners brought them the news that the town of Witherton had been freed. They heard about our men being here to see the wise one and wanted to witness what would happen. The stairs and halls upstairs are full of them. The words that have been spoken down here have spread up through the whole crowd. Kara was obviously concerned about being close enough to protect Richard and Kalen. Kalen knew that many of the people had been swayed by what Richard had been saying, but now she didn't know what they would do. The speakers seemed to have lost their conviction. They didn't want to be associated with the one among them who had done such a thing. One of them finally left his fellow speakers and made the lone walk over to the boy standing beside the curtain-draped platform and under Kalen's protective arm. I am sorry, he said in a sincere voice to the boy. He turned to the people watching. I am sorry. I don't want to be a speaker any longer. Prophecy has been fulfilled. Our redemption is at hand. I think we would do best to listen to what these men have to say. I think I would like to live without the fear that the men of the order are going to murder us all. There were no cheers, no wild ovation, but rather silent agreement, as all the people Kalen could see nodded with what looked like expectant hope that their secret wish to be free of the brutality of the Imperial Order was not a sinful secret thought after all, but was really the right thing. Richard knelt beside Owen as other men worked at tying a strip of cloth around Anson's upper arm. He was sitting up, his whole arm was soaked in blood, but it looked like the bandage was slowing the bleeding. Kalen sighed in relief at seeing that Anson was alive and not seriously hurt. It looks like it will need to be stitched, Richard said. Some of the men agreed. An older man pushed his way through the crowd and stepped forward. I do such things. I also have herbs with which to make a poultice. Thank you, Anson said as his friends helped him stand. He looked lightheaded and the men had to steady him. Once sure of his feet, he turned to Richard. Thank you, Lord Rall, for answering the call in the words of the devotion I spoke. Master Rall, protect us. I never thought I would be the first to bleed for what we have set out to do, or that the blood would be drawn by one of our own people. Richard gently clapped Anson on the back of his good shoulder, showing his appreciation for Anson's words. Owen looked around at the crowd. I think we have all decided to be free again. When the crowd nodded their agreement, Owen turned to Richard. How will we get rid of the soldiers in Northwick? Richard wiped his sword clean on the cloth of the dead speaker's trouser leg. His gaze turned up to the crowd. Any idea how many soldiers there are here in Northwick? There was no anger in his voice. Kalen had seen since the moment he had drawn his sword that his eyes had been absent of the Sword of Truth's attendant magic. There was no spark of the sword's rage in the seeker's eyes. No magic dangerously dancing there, no fury in his demeanor. He had simply done what was necessary to stop the threat. While it was a relief that he had swiftly succeeded, it was gravely worrisome that the sword's magic had not come out along with the sword itself. What had always been there to help him before had apparently finally failed him. That absence of his sword's magic left Kalen feeling icy apprehension. People in the crowd looked around at others and then spoke of hundreds of men of the order they had seen. Another man said there were several thousand. An older woman lifted her hand. Not that many, but approaching it. Owen turned to Richard. That's a lot of men for us to take on. Having never been in a real battle, he didn't know the half of it. Richard didn't seem to hear Owen. He slid his sword back into the scabbard hidden under his black cloak. How do you know, he asked the woman. I am one of the people who help prepare their meals. You mean you people cook for the soldiers? Yes, the old woman said. They do not wish to do it for themselves. When do you next have to cook? We have large kettles we are just starting to get ready for tomorrow's meal. It takes us all night to prepare the stew so that we can cook it tomorrow for their evening meal. Besides that, we also have to work all night making biscuits, eggs, and porridge for their morning meal. Kalen imagined that the soldiers were probably pleased to have such a ready supply of pliant slaves. 
Richard paced in a short track between her and Owen. He pinched his lower lip as he considered the problem. With such a small force of their own, nearly 2,000 armed men was a lot to take on, especially considering how inexperienced the men were. Kalin recognized that Richard was scheming something. He took the arm of the older man, tightening the bandage around Anson's wound. You said you had herbs. Do you know about such things? The man shrugged. Not a great deal, just enough to make simple remedies. Kalin's mood sank. She had thought that maybe this man might know something about making more of the antidote. Do you have access to Lily of the Valley, Oleander, you, Monkshood, Hemlock? The man blinked in surprise. Common enough, I guess, especially just to the north in the wooded areas. Richard turned to his men standing at the fore of the crowd. We must eliminate the men of the order. The less fighting we have to do, the better. While it's still dark, we need to slip out of the city and go collect the things we need. He lifted a hand to the woman who had spoken about cooking for the soldiers. You show us where you're going to do all the cooking of tomorrow's evening meal. We'll bring you some extra ingredients. With what we put in the stew, the soldiers will get violently sick within hours. We will put different things in different kettles so that the symptoms will be different to help create confusion and panic. If we can get enough of the poisons into the stew, most of them will die within hours, suffering everything from weakness and paralysis to convulsions. Late in the night, we'll go in and finish any who aren't yet dead or who may not have eaten. If we prepare carefully, Northwick will be free of the Imperial Order without having to fight them. It will be swiftly ended without any of us being hurt. The room was silent for a moment, then Kalin saw smiles breaking out among the people. A ray of light had come into their lives. With the heady thought of imminent freedom, some began to weep as they suddenly felt the need to come forward and tell brief accounts of those they loved who had been raped, tortured, taken away, or murdered. Now that these people had been given a chance to live, none wanted to turn back. They saw salvation and were willing to do what had to be done to gain it. This will destroy our way of life, someone said, not in bitterness, but in wonder. Redemption is at hand, one of the other people in the crowd added. Chapter 53 Standing in dusty streamers of late-day sunlight, Zed wavered on his feet as he waited not far from the tent where Sister Tahira had just taken a small crate. While she was inside, carefully unpacking and preparing the item of magic for inspection, the guards stood not far off, talking among themselves about their chances of having ale that night. They were hardly worried about a skinny old man with a rod of han around his neck and his arms shackled behind his back, causing them any trouble or running off. Zed used the opportunity to lean against the cargo wagon's rear wheel. He wanted only to be allowed to lie down and go to sleep. Without being obvious, he looked over his shoulder at Addie. She gave him a brief, brave smile. The wagon he leaned against was full of items looted from the keep that had yet to be identified. For all Zed knew, he could be leaning against a wagon full of simple magic meant to entertain and teach children, or something so powerful that it would hand Jagang victory in one blinding instant. Some of the items brought from the keep were unknown to Zed, they had been locked behind shields that he had never been able to breach. Even in his childhood, the old wizards at the keep had not been able to get at what was behind many of the shields. But the men who had assaulted and taken the wizard's keep were untouched by magic and apparently had no trouble getting through shields that had been in place for thousands of years. Everything Zed knew had been turned upside down. In some ways, it seemed like this was not only the end of the wizard's keep, as it had been intended and envisioned, but the end of a way of life as well, and the death of an era. The items brought from the keep that Zed had so far identified were of no great value to Jagang in winning the war. There were a few things, now back in protective crates, that were a mystery to Zed. For all he knew, they could be profoundly dangerous. He wished that they could all be destroyed before one of the Sisters of the Dark discovered how to use them to create havoc. 
Zed looked up when he saw one of the elite soldiers in leather and mail pause not far away, his attention keenly focused on something. His right ear had a big V-shaped notch taken out of the upper portion, the way some farmers marked their swine. Although he wore the same kind of outfit as the rest of the elite soldiers, his boots weren't the same. Zed saw when the man looked around that his left eye didn't open as wide as his right, but then he moved off into the bands of patrolling soldiers. As Zed watched the constantly churning press of soldiers, sisters, and others moving past, he kept having the disconcerting visions of people from his past and others he knew. It was disheartening to be having such will-o'-the-wisps, illusions spawned by a mind that from lack of sleep and perhaps the constant tension was failing him. The faces of some of the elite guards looked hauntingly familiar. He guessed he had been seeing the men for days and they were beginning to look familiar. In the distance, he saw a sister walking past who looked like someone he knew. He had probably met her recently, was all. He'd met a number of sisters recently, and it was never congenial. Zed admonished himself that he had to keep a grasp on his wits. One of the little girls not far away, being held prisoner by a big guard standing over her, was watching Zed, and when he glanced up at her, she smiled. He thought it the oddest thing a frightened child, amid such chaos of soldiers, prisoners, and military activity, could do. He supposed that such a child could not possibly understand that she was there to be tortured if necessary, to make sure Zed told all he knew. He looked away from her long blonde hair cascading down around her shoulders, her beautiful, oddly familiar face. This was madness in more ways than one. The hump-nosed sister emerged from the tent. Bring them in, she snapped. The four guards jumped into action, two seizing Addy, the other two taking Zed. The men were big enough that Zed's weight was trivial to them. The way they held him up by his arms prevented half his steps from touching the ground. They horsed him into the tent, advanced him around the table, spun him around, and dropped him into the chair with such force that it drove the wind from his lungs in a grunt. Zed closed his eyes as he grimaced in pain. He wished they would just kill him so that he wouldn't ever have to open his eyes again. But when they killed him, they would send his head to Richard. Zed hated to think of the anguish that would cause Richard. Well, Sister Tahira asked. Zed opened his eyes and peered at the object sitting before him in the center of the table. His breath caught. He blinked at what he saw, too astonished to let out the breath. It was constructed magic, called a sunset spell. Zed swallowed. Surely none of the sisters had opened it. No, they wouldn't have opened it. He wouldn't be sitting there if they had. Before him on the table sat a small box, the size of half his palm. The box was shaped like the upper half of a stylized sun, a half disk with six pointed rays coming out from it meant to represent the sun setting at the horizon. The box was lacquered a bright yellow. The rays were also yellow, but with lines of orange, green, and blue along their edges. Well, Sister Tahira repeated, Ah! She was looking in her book, not at the small yellow box. What is it? I'm not sure I remember, he said, stalling. The sister wasn't in a patient mood. Do you want me to... Oh, yes, he said, trying to sound nonchalant. I recall now it's a box with a spell that produces a little tune. That much was true. Page 554. The sister was still reading in her book. Zed glanced back over his shoulder at Addie, sitting on the bench. He could see in her eyes that she knew by his demeanor that something was up. He hoped the sister couldn't detect the same thing. It's a music box then, Sister Tahira murmured, more interested in her catalog of magic. Yes, that's right, a box that contains a spell for music. When you remove the lid, it produces a melody. Sweat trickled down from his neck, down between his shoulder blades. Zed swallowed and tried not to let his trembling carry in his voice. Take the lid off, you'll see. She peered suspiciously over the top of the book. 
You take the lid off. Well, I can't. My hands are shackled behind my back. Use your teeth. My teeth? The sister used the back end of her pen to push the yellow half-sun box closer to him. Yes, your teeth. He had been counting on her suspicion, but he dared not overplay it. He worked his tongue in his mouth, desperately trying to work up some saliva. Blood would be better, but he knew that if he bit the inside of his lip, the sister would get suspicious. Blood was too common a catalyst. Before the sister got leery, Zed leaned forward and tried to stretch his lips around the box. He had to get his bottom teeth at the bottom of the sun and his top teeth hooked over a pointed ray. The box was a hair too big. With a hand on the back of his head, Sister Tahira pushed him down on it. That was all he needed, and he captured the lid with his teeth. He lifted the lid, but the whole box came up off the table. He shook his head, and at last the top came free. He set the lid aside. If not opened by a party to the theft of items preserved at the keep, a sunset spell had to be activated by a wizard whom the spell would recognize. Quickly, before she saw what he was doing, he let some saliva drop into the box in order to activate the spell. Zed felt giddy as the music started. It worked. It was still viable. He glanced through the narrow slit of the tent flap. The sun would be down soon. He wanted to jump up and dance to the merry tune. He wanted to let out a whoop. Even though he didn't have long to live, he still felt exhilarated. The ordeal was almost over. In a short time, all the things of magic that were stolen would be destroyed, and he would be dead. They would never get anything out of him. He would not betray their cause. He felt bad that the captured families who were being used to help gain his cooperation would also die, but at least they would no longer have to suffer. He felt a sudden pang of sadness that Addie, too, would die. He hated the thought of that nearly as much as the thought of her suffering. The sister reached in and replaced the lid. Very cute. The music stopped. It didn't matter, though. The spell had been activated. The music was simply confirmation and a warning to get out of range. No chance of that. It didn't matter. Sister Tahira scooped the yellow box off the table. I'm going to put this back. She leaned down toward Zed. While I'm gone, I'm going to have the guards bring in the next child and let you have a good look at her. Let you think about what those men in the next tent are going to do to her, without hesitation, if you stall and waste our time like that again. But I... His words were cut off as she used the Radahan around his neck to send a shock of searing pain from the base of his skull down to his hips. His back arched as he cried out, nearly losing consciousness. He slumped back in his chair, his head hanging back, unable to lift it for the moment. Come with me, Sister Tahira said to the guards. I'll need some help. The guard who brings in the next child can watch them for a few minutes. Panting from the lingering pain, tears filling his eyes, Zed stared at the ceiling of the tent. He saw light as the flap was opened. Shadows moved across the canvas as the sister and the four men left, and she sent in the guard with the child. Zed stared up at the ceiling, not wanting to look at the face of another child. Finally, recovered from the bout of pain, he sat up. One of the big elite guards, dressed in their leather, mail, and a broad belt holding an assortment of weapons, stood to the side with a blonde-headed girl held before him. It was the girl who had smiled. Zed closed his eyes a moment in the agony of what they would do to this poor child who reminded him so much of someone he knew. When he opened his eyes, she smiled again. Then she winked. Zed blinked. She lifted up her flower print dress just enough so that Zed could see two knives strapped to each of her thighs. He blinked again at what he was seeing. He looked up into her smiling face. Rachel, he whispered. Her smile widened into a beaming grin. Zed looked up at the face of the big man standing guard behind her. Dear spirits, Zed whispered. It was the boundary warden.
I hear you've gotten yourself into a bit of trouble, Chase said. For an instant, Zed thought that for sure he must be seeing things. Then he realized why Rachel looked so familiar yet different. She was more than two and a half years older than the last time he'd seen her. Her blonde hair, once chopped short, was now long. She had to be nearly a foot taller. Chase hooked his thumbs behind the broad leather belt. Addie, as level-headed as you are, I imagine it had to be Zed who got you into this fix. Zed looked over his shoulder. Addie wore a beautiful, tearful smile. He couldn't remember the last time he had seen her smile. He be nothing but trouble, she told the boundary warden. It had been two and a half years since he'd seen Chase. The boundary warden was an old friend. He was the one who had taken them to meet Addie back then so she could show Richard the way through the boundary before Dark and Rawl had brought it down. Chase was older than Richard, but one of his dearest and most trusted friends. An older boundary warden, Friedrich, came looking for me, Chase explained. He said that Lord Rawl had sent him to the keep to warn you about some trouble. He said that Richard had told him about me, and since you were gone and the keep had been captured, he came to Westland looking for me. Boundary wardens can always count on one another. Rachel and I decided to come pull your scrawny hide out of the fire. Zed glanced at the sunlight coming through the tent's narrow opening. You have to get out of here before the sun sets, or you'll be killed. Hurry, get out of here while you can. Chase lifted an eyebrow. I've come all this way, and I don't intend to leave without you. But you don't understand. A knife poked through the side of the tent and ran a slit down through the canvas. One of the elite guards pushed his way in through the slit. Zed stared in astonishment. The man looked familiar, but he didn't look right. No, Zed called to Chase as the big man went for the axe hanging at his hip. Stay where you are, the man who came in through the slit in the side of the tent said to Chase. There's a man right outside who will put a sword through you if you move. Zed's jaw dropped. Captain Zimmer? Of course. I've come to get you out of here. But, but you have black hair. The captain flashed one of his infectious smiles. Soot. Not a good idea to have blonde hair in the middle of Jagang's camp. I've come to rescue you. Zed was incredulous. But you all have to get out of here. Hurry, before the sun sets. Get out. Do you have any more men? Chase asked the captain. A handful. Who are you? An old friend, Zed told him. Now look here. At that, cries and shouts came from outside. Captain Zimmer rushed to the tent's opening. A man poked his head in. It's not us, he said in answer to the captain's unspoken question. In the distance, Zed could hear the shouts of, Assassin! Captain Zimmer rushed behind Zed and worked a key in the manacles. They broke open. Zed's arms were suddenly free. The captain hurried to undo Addie's as she stood and turned her back to him. Sounds like our chance, Rachel said. Let's use the commotion to get you out of here. The brains of the group, Chase said with a grin. The first thing Zed did when his arms were free was fall to his knees and hug the girl. He couldn't bring forth words, but they weren't needed. To feel her spindly arms around his neck was better than any words. I've missed you, Zed, she whispered in his ear. Outside the tent, mayhem had broken out. Orders were being shouted, men were running, and in the distance the clash of steel rang out. The sister burst back into the tent. She saw Zed free and immediately released a bolt of power through his collar. The shock sent him sprawling. Just then, a second young blonde sister in a drab brown wool dress charged in behind Sister Tahira. Sister Tahira spun around. The second sister smacked her so hard it nearly knocked the woman from her feet. Without pause, Sister Tahira unleashed a bolt of her power that lit the inside of the tent with a blinding flash. Instead of it blasting the second sister back through the tent's doorway, as Zed had expected, Sister Tahira cried out and crumpled to the ground. Got you, the second sister growled as she planted a boot on Sister Tahira's neck, keeping her on the ground. Zed blinked in astonishment. Rika! Rika was already turning her Aegeal in her fist. She held it toward Chase. 
Rika? Captain Zimmer asked from the other side of the tent, sounding startled, not just to see who it was, but perhaps to see the moored Sith with her blonde hair undone from its single braid and flying free. Zimmer? She frowned at his black hair. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? He gestured to her dress. What are you wearing? Rika grinned, that wicked grin she had. The dress of a sister. Sister? Zed asked. What sister? Rika shrugged. One who didn't want to give up her dress. She lost her head over the whole affair. With her finger and thumb, Rika pulled her lower lip out. See, I borrowed her ring, too. I spread the split and hung it here, so I'd look like a real sister. Rika pulled Sister Tahira up by her hair and shoved her toward Addy. Get that thing off her neck. I will do no such... Rika drove her Aegeal up under the sister's chin. Blood gushed out over her lower lip. The sister started choking on it as she gasped in agony. I said, get that thing off Addy's neck, and don't you ever question me again. Sister Tahira scrambled to Addy to do as the moored Sith had commanded. Chase planted his fists on his hips as he glared down at Zed, still on the ground. So what are we going to do now? Draw straws to see who gets to rescue you? Bags, isn't anyone listening? You people have to get out of here. Rachel shook a finger at Zed. Now, Zed, you know you're not supposed to say bad words in front of children. Sputtering in frustration, Zed gaped up at Chase. I know, the Boundary Warden said with a sigh. She's been a trial for me, too. The sun's about to set, Zed roared. It would be better if we could delay until it did, Captain Zimmer said. It would be easier to get out of camp in the dark. A humming noise filled the tent, making the very air vibrate, and then there was a sudden metallic pop. Addie cried out with relief as the collar fell away. Isn't anyone listening? Zed scrambled to his feet and shook his fists. I've ignited a sunset spell. A what? Chase asked. A sunset spell. It's a protective device from the keep. It's a shield of sorts. When it recognizes that other shields are being violated and protected items are being taken, it insinuates itself among the stolen goods. When a thief opens it to see what it is, it activates the spell. At the first sunset, the spell ignites and destroys everything that has been plundered. Sister Tahira shook her fist at him. You fool! Rika seized his arm. Then let's get going. Chase grabbed Zed's other arm and pulled him back. Now hold on. Zed yanked both arms free and pointed out through the slit in the side of the tent in the setting sun. We've got mere moments until this place is a fireball. How big a fireball? Captain Zimmer asked. Zed threw up his hands. It will kill thousands. It won't destroy the camp by any means, but this whole area is going to be leveled. Everyone started talking, but Chase cut them all off with an angry command for silence. Now, listen to me. If we look like we're escaping, we'll be caught. Captain, you and your men will come with me. We'll pretend like Zed and Addy are our prisoners. Rachel, too. That's how I got in here. I found out they were holding children. He flipped a hand toward Rika and Sister Tahira. They will look like sisters in charge of prisoners, along with us playing as the guards. Do you want that thing off your neck first? Rika asked Zed. No time for that now. Let's go. Addy grabbed Zed's arm. No. What? Listen to me, old man. There be those families and children in these tents around us. They will die. You go. Get to the keep. I will get the innocent people out of here. Zed didn't like the idea, but arguing with Addy was a fool's task. And besides, there was no time. We split up then, Captain Zimmer said. Me and my men will play the part of guards and get the men, women, and children out of here, back to our lines along with Eddie. Rika nodded. Tell Verna that I'm going to go with Zed to help take back the keep. He will need a moored Sith to keep him out of trouble. Everyone looked around to see if there would be any arguments. No one said anything. It suddenly seemed settled. Done, Zed said. He threw his arms around Addie and kissed her cheek. Be careful. Tell Verna I'm going to take the keep back. Help her defend the passes. Addie nodded. Be careful. Listen to Chase. He be a good man to come all this way for you. 
Zed smiled and then gasped as Chase grabbed his robes and yanked him out of the tent. The sun is setting. Let's get out of here. Remember, you're our prisoner. I know the part, Zed grumbled as he was dragged out of the tent like a sack of grain. He smiled as Addie, already rushing away, looked over her shoulder one last time. She smiled back and then was gone. Wait, Zed called. He quickly reached into one of the wagons and retrieved something he didn't want to be destroyed. He slipped it into a pocket. All right, let's go. Outside the tent, the camp was in pandemonium. Elite guards in a state of high alert and with weapons drawn raced past on their way toward the command tents. Other men ran to the ring of barricades. Trumpets blared alarms and coded messages that directed men to tasks. Zed feared his small group might be set upon and held for questioning. Instead of waiting for that to happen, Chase reached out and snatched a soldier running past. What's the matter with you? Get me some protection for these prisoners until I can get them to a safe place. The Emperor will have our heads if we allow them to be recaptured. The soldier quickly collected a dozen men and fell in around Rika, Sister Tahira, Chase, Rachel, and Zed. Rachel was doing a convincing job of bawling in fear. For effect, Chase would occasionally give her a shake and yell at her to shut up. Zed glanced back over his shoulder, seeing the sun touch the horizon. He growled at Rika out ahead for her to pick up her pace. At the barricades, scowling guards looked them over carefully as they approached and then opened their ranks. They were preventing anyone from getting in and were momentarily confused by such a company of their own men with prisoners making their way out. One man decided to step out to stop and question them. Chase straight-armed him. Idiot! Out of our way! Emperor's orders! The man frowned as he stared at the procession sweeping past. While he considered what to do, they were past and gone, swallowed up in the larger camp. In moments, they were out of the heart of the camp. In short order, regular soldiers, seeing Rika at the lead, moved to block their path. A beautiful woman out among the regular soldiers was asking for trouble, and with the confusion the men saw in the command area, they believed they had an opportunity while those in authority were busy. Rika and Chase kept their small group moving at a quick pace. The grinning soldiers closed ranks, blocking the way. One of the men, missing his two front teeth, took a step out in front of his men. With one thumb hooked behind his belt, he held up the other hand. Hold on there! I think the ladies would like to stay for a visit. Without pause, Rachel reached under the hem of her dress and pulled a knife. She didn't slow or even look back as she flipped the knife up over her shoulder. In one fluid motion without missing a step, Chase caught the knife by the tip and heaved it at the toothless man. With a thunk, the knife slammed hilt deep into the man's forehead. As he was still toppling back, Rachel flipped a second knife up over her shoulder. Chase caught it and sent it on its way. As the second man twisted toward the ground, dead, the rest of the men backed away to let the small group marching onward in among them. Deadly fights within the Imperial Order camp were not a rarity. Elite guards or not, the soldiers were confident in their numbers, and with a beautiful woman in their midst, sure of what they wanted, men all around closed in. Zed snatched a quick glance back. Now, hit the ground! Rika, Chase, Rachel, and Zed dove to the dirt. For an instant, everyone above them froze, staring in surprise. The soldiers who were accompanying them, weapons already drawn for the fight they expected, also stopped and stood in confusion. Sister Tahira saw her opportunity and cried out, Help! These people are... The world ignited with brilliant white light. An instant later, a thunderous blast rocked the ground. A wall of debris followed, driven before a roar of noise. Men were blown into the air. Some were cut down by flying wreckage. The elite guards that had escorted them tumbled through the air over Zed. Sister Tahira had turned toward the flash. A wagon wheel shot toward them at incredible speed, hitting her chest high, cutting her in two. The bloodied wheel sailed onward without even being slowed. The sisters' shredded remains were flung across the ground along with the bodies of countless men. 
As the blast from behind still rumbled, the screams of terribly wounded men rose into the lingering rays of sunset. Zed dearly hoped that Addy had not wasted any time in escaping. Chase seized Zed's robes at one shoulder and hauled him to his feet as he swept Rachel up in his other arm. Rika grabbed Zed's robes at the other shoulder and pulled him ahead. Together, Zed's two rescuers rushed with him into the carnage. Rachel hid her face in Chase's shoulder. Zed was about to ask Chase why in the world he would teach a young girl such things with knives when he recalled that he himself had been the one who had once commanded Chase to the task of teaching her everything the Boundary Warden knew. Rachel was a special person. Zed had wanted her to be prepared for what life might have in store. You should have let me make the sister take off that collar when we had the chance, Rika said as they ran. If we had taken the time, Zed answered, we would have been back there and caught up in that fireball. I suppose, she said. As they slowed a bit to catch their breath, men ran in every direction. In the confusion and disorder, no one noticed that the four of them were making good their escape. As they hastily made their way through the vast Imperial Order encampment, Zed put an arm around Rika's shoulders and pulled her closer. Thank you for coming to save my life. She flashed him a cunning smile. I wouldn't leave you to those pigs. Not after all you've done for us. Besides, Lord Rall has Kara protecting him. I'm sure he would want a Mord Sith protecting his grandfather as well. Zed had been right. The world was turned upside down. We have horses and supplies hidden, Chase said. On our way out of this place, we'd better take a horse for Rika. Rachel looked back over Chase's shoulder, her arms around his neck. She gave Zed a serious frown as she whispered, Chase is unhappy because he had to leave all his weapons behind and be so lightly armed. Zed glanced to the battle axe at one hip, the sword at Chase's other, and two knives at the small of his back. Yes, I can see where being so defenseless would make a man grumpy. I don't like this place, Rachel whispered in Chase's ear. He patted her back as she laid her head on his shoulder. We'll be back in the woods in no time, little one. Amid the screams and death, it was as tender a sight as Zed could imagine. Chapter 54 Verna paused when the sentry rushed up in the dark. She moved her hands up on the reins closer to the bit to keep her horse from spooking. Prelate, I think it might be an attack of some sort, the soldier said in breathless worry. She frowned at the man. What might be an attack? What is it? There's something coming up the road, he pointed back toward Dobbin Pass. A wagon, I think. The enemy was always sending things at them, men sneaking through the darkness, horses encased in spells designed to blow a breach in their shields, running wildly toward them, innocent enough wagons with archers hiding inside, powerful spell-driven winds laced with magic conjuring of every sort. Since it's dark, the commander thinks it's suspicious, and we shouldn't take any chances. Sounds wise, Verna said. She had to get back to their camp. She had made the rounds herself to get a good look at their defenses, to see the men at the outposts before their nightly meeting back at camp to go over the day's reports. The commander wants to destroy the wagon before it gets too close. I've checked, Prelate. There are no other sisters at hand. If you don't want to see to this, we can have the men up above drop a rock slide on the wagon and crush it. Verna had to get back to meet with the officers. You had better tell your commander to take care of it in whatever manner he sees fit. The soldier saluted with snap of a fist to his heart. Verna pulled her horse around and put a foot into the stirrup. Why would the Imperial Order think they could get a wagon through, especially at night? Certainly they weren't foolish enough to think it wouldn't be seen in the dark. She paused and looked at the soldier hurrying away. Wait. He stopped and turned. I changed my mind. I'll go with you. It was foolish to use the rocks they had ready overhead. They might need them if a full-scale attack suddenly charged up this pass. It was silly to waste such a defense. She followed the man up the trail to the lookout point where his company waited. The men were all watching through the trees. 
The road out ahead and below them looked silver in the light of the rising moon. Verna inhaled the fragrance of balsam firs as she watched the wagon making its way up the silvery road, being pulled by a single plodding horse. Tense archers waited at the ready. They had a shielded lantern standing by to light fire arrows in order to set the wagon ablaze. Verna didn't see anyone in the wagon. An empty wagon seemed pretty suspicious. She recalled the strange message from Anne warning her to let an empty wagon through. But they had already done that. Verna recalled that the girl with the message from Jagang had come in by this route and method. Verna's heart pounded in worry at the thought of what new message Jagang might be sending now. Perhaps it was Zed's and Addie's heads. Hold, she called to the archers. Let it through, but stand at the ready in case it's a trick. Verna made her way down the narrow path between the trees. She stood behind a screen of spruce watching. When the wagon was close enough, she opened a small gap in the weave of the vast shield she and the sisters had spun across the pass. The pattern of magic was barbed with every nasty sort of magic they could conjure. This pass was small enough that the shields alone could hold it, and if the enemy did come, it was too small for any numbers to come all at once. Even without the formidable shield, the pass was relatively easy to hold. When the wagon passed through the shield, Verna closed the hole. When it rolled close enough, one of the men ran out of the trees and took control of the horse. As the wagon drew to a halt, dozens of archers behind him and on the other side, behind Verna, drew their weapons. Verna had spun a web of magic, and she was prepared to unleash it at the slightest provocation. The tarp in the bed of the wagon eased back. A little girl sat up. It was the child who had brought the message the last time. Her face lit up at seeing Verna, someone she recognized. Verna's heart skipped a beat at the thought of what the message might be this time. I brought some friends, the girl said. People lying in the back of the wagon pulled the tarp aside and started sitting up. They looked like parents with their frightened children. Verna blinked in shock when she saw some of the people help Addie up. The sorceress looked to be exhausted. Her black and gray hair was no longer parted neatly in the middle, but was in as much disarray as Zed's usually was. Verna rushed over, leaning in to help the woman. Addie! Oh, Addie, am I ever glad to see you! The old sorceress smiled. I be awfully happy to see you too, Verna. Verna's gaze swept over the people in the wagon, her heart still pounding with apprehension. Where's Zed? He escaped as well. Verna closed her eyes with a silent prayer of gratitude. Her eyes popped open. If he escaped, then where is he? He be on his way back to the keep in Aidendrill, Addie said in her raspy voice. The enemy has captured it. We heard. That old man intends to have his keep back. Knowing Zed, I feel sorry for anyone who gets in his way. Rika be with him. Rika? What was she doing over there? I ordered her not to do that. Verna realized how that must have sounded. We thought it would be pointless, that she wouldn't have a chance, and we would just lose her for nothing. Rika be Mord Sith. She has a mind of her own. Verna shook her head. Well, even though she wasn't supposed to do that, now that I see you again and know Zed has escaped as well, I'm glad that that obstinate woman didn't listen to me. Captain Zimmer be on his way back as well. Captain Zimmer? Yes, he and some of his men decided to come to rescue us as well. They be coming back the way they travel, unseen in the night. Addie gestured to the surrounding trees. They be up around us, protecting the wagon on our way in. The captain feared that some of the enemy might stop the wagon and capture us all over again. He wanted to make sure we'd be safe. The captain and his men had special signals that allowed them to move through the pass without being attacked by their own men or the sisters by mistake. The nature of the way Captain Zimmer and his men worked was that they were, for the most part, outside regular command. Kalin had set it up that way so they could act on their own initiative. While it could at times be aggravating, those men accomplished more than anyone ever expected. Zed wanted me to help these people escape, Addie gave Verna a meaningful look. 
There be others we could not help. Verna glanced over at the people huddling together at the back of the wagon. I can only imagine what your gang has been doing with people like that. No, Addie said. I doubt you can. Verna changed to an even more horrifying subject. Has Jagang been able to find anything from the keep so far that he will use against us? Thankfully, no. Zed set a spell that destroyed the thing stolen from the keep. There'd be a big explosion in the middle of their camp. Like the one back in Adendril that killed so many of them? No. But it still caused much destruction and killed some important people. Even some of Jagang's sisters, I believe. Verna never thought she would see the day that she would be pleased to hear that Sisters of the Light had died. Those women were controlled by the Dreamwalker, and even when they had been offered freedom, they had been too afraid to believe those trying to rescue them. They had chosen to remain Jagang slaves. With a sudden thought, Verna grabbed a fistful of Addie's robes. Could the spell Zed ignited possibly have taken out Jagang? With her completely white eyes, Abby looked back up Dobbin Pass toward the Imperial Order camp. I wish I had better news, Prelate, but Captain Zimmer on the way out told me that just as we were about to be rescued, an assassin managed to get deep into the inner camp. An assassin? Who was it? Where was he from? None of us knows. He appeared much like others from the old world. The intruder be driven by a single-minded determination to get to Jagang and kill him. He somehow made it into the inner defenses, killed some people, and took the uniform of the elite guards so he might get to Jagang. The guards somehow recognized he not be one of their own. They hacked the man to pieces before he could get close to the Emperor. Jagang left the area until his men could check over their defenses and make sure there be no more assassins about. Many of the sisters went with him, helping with his safeguards. That be when Zed set off the sunset spell. We did not know Jagang had left the area, but it would have made no difference. Zed had to use the spell when it be put before him. The spell be triggered by the sun setting. Verna nodded. For a moment she had been hoping. Still, you and Zed escaped, and that's what matters for now. Thank the Creator. A surprising number of people showed up all at once to rescue us. Addie lifted an eyebrow. I do not recall seeing the Creator among them. The warm breeze ruffled Verna's curly hair. I suppose not, but you know what I mean. The crickets in the woods kept up their steady chirping. Life seemed to be a little sweeter, their situation a little less hopeless. She let out a sigh. I hope the Creator will at least help Zed and Rika take back the keep. Zed will not need the Creator's help, Addie said. Another man showed up to help get us out. Chase be an old friend of Zed, me, and Richard. Chase will have those holding the keep praying for the protection of the Creator. Then we can look forward to the day the keep is back in our hands and Jagang is denied help in breaking through the passes into Dahara. Verna waved her arm, signaling, and the four couples standing at the back of the wagon shuffled forward with their children. Welcome to Dahara, Verna told them. You will be safe here. Thank you for helping us get out, one of the men said with a bow of his head to Addie. I feel ashamed now of the terrible things I had been thinking of you. Addie smiled to herself as she tightened her thin fingers on his shoulder. True, but I could not blame you. The girl who had brought the message the last time tugged on Verna's dress. This is my mother and father. I told them how nice you were to me before. Verna squatted down and hugged the girl. Welcome back, child. Welcome back. Chapter 55 Whenever a breath of wind sighed among the branches above, silvery streamers of moonlight cascading down through the forest canopy glided about in the darkness like ghosts on the prowl. Kaylin peered around, barely able to make out the somber shapes of the looming trees as she tried to see if there was anything that did not belong. She heard no chirps of bugs, no small animals scurrying among the leaf litter, no mockingbirds singing throughout the night as there had been. Carefully picking her way over the mossy ground, 
She did her best to see in the gloom so as not to step in holes and cracks in the rocky places or pools of standing water in the low areas. Ahead of her, Richard slipped through the open forest like a shadow. At times he seemed to disappear, causing her to fear that he might no longer be with them. He had ordered everyone following behind him not to talk and to walk as quietly as possible, but none of them could move through the woods as silently as he did. For some reason, Richard was as tense as his bowstring. He felt that something was wrong, but he didn't know what. While it might seem a beautiful moonlit night in the woods, the way Richard was acting on top of the haunting silence had draped a pall of foreboding over everyone. Kalin was at least pleased that the skies had cleared. The rains of recent days had made travel not just difficult, but miserable. While it hadn't really been cold, the wet made it feel so. Taking shelter had not been an option. Until they had the final dose of the antidote, they had no choice but to press on. The antidote from Northwick had improved Richard's condition a little, in addition to stopping the advance of the symptoms of his poisoning, but now the temporary improvement was dissipating. Kaylin was so worried for him that she had no appetite. They now had well over double the number of men with them, and many more than that were making their way toward the city of Houghton by different routes. Those other groups of men planned to eliminate the lesser detachments of Imperial Order soldiers stationed in villages along the way. Richard, Kalin, and their smaller group were pushing toward Houghton as rapidly as possible, deliberately avoiding contact with the enemy so as to get there before Nicholas and his soldiers knew they were on their way stealth would afford them the best chance of recovering the final dose of the antidote. Once they had the antidote, then they could gather with the rest of the men for an attack. Kalin knew that if they could first eliminate Nicholas, it would make it much easier and less risky to defeat the remaining Imperial Order troops. If she could somehow find a way to get close to Nicholas, she could touch him with her power. She knew better than to suggest such an idea to Richard, he would never go along with it. To a certain extent, Kalin felt responsible for what these people had suffered under the Imperial Order. After all, if not for her freeing the chimes, the boundary protecting Bandakar would still be in place. Yet if these people could rid themselves of the Imperial Order, the changes that had come about also meant the true freedom they had never really enjoyed, and with it, the opportunity for better lives. The change in the people in Northwick had been heartening to witness. That night, the men Richard and Kalin had brought had stayed up most of the night talking to the people there, explaining the things Richard and Kalin had explained to them. The morning after the annihilation of the soldiers who had taken over the city and held them in the grip of fear, the people had celebrated by singing and dancing in the streets. Those people had learned not only just how precious freedom really was, but also that their old ways provided no real tools for improving the quality of their lives. After Richard had dissolved the ancient illusions of the wise one's wisdom and the meaningless tenets the speakers substituted for knowledge, and after the killing of the enemy soldiers, the men of Northwick had not been shy about volunteering to help rid their land of the imperial order. Freed from the enforced blindness of a repressive mindset, many now hungered aloud for a future of their own making. Kalin unexpectedly came up against Richard's outstretched arm. She put a hand to her chest over her galloping heart, then immediately turned and passed the signal to stop back to those behind. There was still no sound in the dark woods, not so much as the buzz of a mosquito. Richard slipped his pack off of his back, set it on a low rock, and started quietly searching through it. Kalin leaned close to whisper. What are you doing? Fire. We need light. Pass the word back for some of the men to get out torches. While Richard pulled out a steel and flint, Kalin whispered instructions to Kara, who in turn passed them back. In short order, several men tiptoed forward with torches. The men gathered in close, squatting down beside a low jumble of rock next to Richard. He picked a stick up off the ground and dipped it in a small container from his pack. He then wiped the stick across the top of a high point on the rock. I'm putting some pine resin on this rock, he told the men. 
Hold your torches over it so that when I strike a spark and the resin flames up, it will light the torches. Pine resin, painstakingly collected from rotting trees, was valuable for starting fires in the rain. A spark would ignite it even when wet. It burned hot enough to often be able to catch damp wood on fire. Richard had always seemed at home in the dark. Kalen had never seen him need to have light like this. She stared intently out into the night, wondering what it was he thought might be out there that they couldn't see. Kara, Richard whispered, pass the word back. I want everyone to get out a weapon, now. Without hesitation, Kara turned to pass on the orders. After a seemingly endless span of silence, broken only by the soft whisper of steel sliding past leather, word came back, and she leaned down toward Richard. Done. Richard looked up at Kalen and Jensen. Both of you as well. Kalen drew her sword. Jensen, her silver-handled dagger with the ornate letter R that stood for the house of Rawl. Richard struck the spark. The pine pitch flamed up with an angry hiss. The torches caught. Light ignited in the heart of the dark forest. In the sudden harsh glare, everyone turned and looked about to see what might be hiding in the darkness around them. Men gasped. In the trees all around them, perched on branches everywhere, sat black-tipped races. Hundreds of them. Beady black eyes watched the people. In that moment of sudden bright light, everything but the flickering flame was silent and still. With a burst of wild cries, the races launched their attack. From all around, all at once, the races descended on them. The night air suddenly filled with a riot of glossy black feathers, the sweep of huge wings, hooked beaks, and reaching talons. After such a long silence, the sound of piercing cries and beating wings was deafening. Everywhere the people met the attack with fierce determination. Some of the men were knocked to the ground or stumbled and fell. Others cried out as they tried to protect themselves with one arm while driving off the attack with the other. Men hacked at the races atop their friends and turned to ward off other screeching beasts that flew in toward them. Kaylin saw the red-striped breast of a race abruptly appear right before her face. She swung her sword, lopped off a wing, and spun around, bringing the sword up to hit another bird coming in from the other side. She stabbed a race on the ground at her feet as it reached in with its beak like a vulture to try to rip flesh from her leg. Richard's sword was a blur of silver slashing through the winged attackers. A cloud of black feathers surrounded him. The birds were attacking everyone, but the assault appeared to be centered around Richard. It almost seemed as if the races were trying to drive the people back from Richard so that more of the birds could get at him. Jensen frantically stabbed at birds going for him. Kalen swung at others, knocking them to the ground, wounded or dead. With measured efficiency, Kara snatched them out of the air and swiftly wrung their necks. Everywhere, men stabbed, cut, and hacked at the onslaught of fierce raptors. Some men used their torches as weapons. The night was filled with the screams of the birds, with the flapping of wings, with the thud of weapons striking home. Birds tumbled and fell as they were hit. More dove in to take their place. The trees all around poured the monstrous birds down on them. Wounded and dying birds struggling on the ground made the forest floor a writhing sea of black feathers. The ferocity of the attack was frightening, and then it was suddenly over. A few of the birds on the ground, wings spread, still tried to get up, their feathers making a silken rasp as they rubbed against the feathers of dead birds beneath them. Here and there, men stabbed or chopped at a bird still alive on the ground at their feet. It wasn't long before all the creatures finally went still. No more races came from the sky. Dead races mounded up against Richard like snow drifted in a storm. Men panted as they held torches aloft. They peered into the darkness beyond the light, looking for any sign of more trouble from above. But for the hissing of the torches, the night was silent. The branches of the trees all around appeared to be empty. Kalen could see scratches and cuts on Richard's arms and hands. 
she waded through the sea of dead birds to get to his pack sitting on a nearby rock. The forest floor around him was nearly knee-deep with dead races. She had to flip a dead bird off Richard's pack. Pushing her hand down into his pack, she blindly searched until her fingers found a folded wax paper that contained a salve. Kara rushed in close to Richard when she saw him unsteady on his feet. She grasped his arm, lending him support. What in the world was that all about? Jensen asked, panting, still catching her breath as she pulled strands of red ringlets off her sweaty face. I guess they finally decided to try to get us, Owen said. Jensen patted Betty's head when the goat stepped unhurt through the corpses of races to get in closer to her friends. One thing for sure is that they finally found us again. There was an important difference this time, Richard said. They weren't following us. They were here, waiting for us. Everyone stared at him. What do you mean? Kalen paused at daubing salve on his cuts. They've followed us before. They must have seen us. Betty moved in closer, leaning against Kalen's leg to stand and watch her and Richard talking. Kalen wasn't in the mood to be scratching the goat's ears, so she pushed her out of the way. Richard laid a hand on Kara's shoulder to steady himself. Kalen noticed how he swayed on his feet. At times he was having difficulty standing. No, they haven't been following us. The skies have been empty. Richard gestured to the dead birds all around him. These races weren't following us. They were waiting for us. They knew we were coming here. They lay in wait. That was a chilling thought, if it was true. Kalen straightened, holding the waxed paper in one hand, a finger of her other hand loaded with salve, waiting. How could they possibly know where we were going? That's what I'd like to know, Richard said. Nicholas glided back into his body, his mouth still opened wide in a yawn that was not a yawn. He stretched his neck to one side and then the other. He smiled with his delight in the game. It had been dazzling. It had been delicious. His widening grin bared his teeth. Nicholas staggered to his feet, wavering unsteadily for a moment. It reminded him of the way Richard Rall swayed on his feet, dizzy with the effects of a poison that was inexorably doing its deadly work. Poor Richard Rall needed the last dose of the antidote. Nicholas opened his mouth again in a yawn that was not a yawn, twisting his head, eager to be away, eager to learn more. He would return soon enough. He would watch them. Watch them as they worried, as they struggled in vain to understand what was happening. Watch them as they approached. They would reach him in mere hours. The fun was truly about to begin. Nicholas wound his way across the room, stepping between the bodies sprawled everywhere. They had all died suddenly when the races were killed. Here and there, the dead were stacked in piles atop one another, the way the races in those dark woods had been heaped around Richard Rall. Such violent deaths. Those spirits had been horrified as they were slaughtered, but there was nothing they could do to stop it. Nicholas had controlled their souls, their fate. Now they were beyond his control. Now they belonged to the keeper of the dead. Nicholas ran his fingernails back through his hair, shivering with delight as he felt the slick oils glide through his fingers and against his palm. He had to drag three bodies aside before he could get at the door. He threw the heavy latch over and opened the thick door. Najari, the man stood not far away, leaning against the wall, waiting. His muscular form straightened. What is it? Nicholas opened his arm back in a graceful indication, his fingers tipped with black nails stretching wide. There is a mess in here that needs to be cleaned up. Get some men and have these bodies taken away. Najari stepped to the door and stretched his neck to peer into the room. The whole crowd we brought in? Yes, Nicholas snapped. I needed them all. And some more I had the soldiers fetch for me. I'm done with them all now. Get rid of them. When the races had attacked, each had been driven by the soul of one of these ungifted people, and each of those souls had been driven by Nicholas. It had been a stupendous achievement. The simultaneous command of so many with such precision and coordination, 
When the races had been killed, though, so too died the bodies back in the room with Nicholas. He supposed that one day he really should learn how to call back such spirits when their hosts died. It would save him from having to get new ones each time. But people were plentiful. Besides, if he were to find a way to call them back, then he would have to mind the people once their spirits returned, after they had learned his use of them. Still, it was annoying when Richard Rawl killed those Nicholas used to help him watch. How much longer? Najari asked. Nicholas smiled, knowing what the man was curious about. Soon, very soon. You must get these people out of here before they arrive. Then, keep your men out of the way. Let them do as they will. Najari flashed a cunning smile. As you wish, Nicholas. Nicholas lifted an eyebrow. Emperor, Nicholas. Najari chuckled as he started away to get his men. Emperor, Nicholas. You know, Najari, I've been thinking. Najari turned back. About what? About Jagang. We've worked so hard. What reason is there for me to bow to him? A legion of my silent army could swoop in upon him, and that would be that. I wouldn't even need an army. He could mount his horse one day, and I would be there in the beast waiting to throw him and trample him to death. Najari rubbed his stubble. True enough. Of what use is Jagang, really? I could just as easily rule the Imperial Order. In fact, I would be better suited to it. Najari cocked his head. Then what of the plans we've already laid? Nicholas shrugged. Why change them? But why should I give the Mother Confessor to Jagang? And why let him have the world? Perhaps I will keep her for my own amusement and have the world as well. Chapter 56 Richard pressed his back up against the clabbered wall. He had to pause a moment, waiting for the world to stop spinning. He was so cold he felt numb. As dark as it was, he was having difficulty seeing, but it was more than the darkness. He knew that his sight was beginning to fail him. At night it was worse. He had always been able to see better at night than most other people. Now he was no better able to see at night than Kalin. That wasn't a big difference, but he knew it was meaningful. The third stage of the poison had begun. Fortunately, they were close to having the final dose. This is the alleyway here, Owen whispered. Richard looked up and down the street. He didn't see anything moving. The city of Houghton was asleep. He wished he could be, too. He was so exhausted and dizzy he could hardly put one foot in front of the other. He had to take shallow breaths to keep from coughing. Coughing brought on the worst pain. At least he wasn't coughing up blood. Coughing now, though, could be fatal. So he swallowed, trying to stifle the urge. If they made any noise, it might alert the soldiers. When Owen moved into the alleyway, Richard, Kalen, Kara, Jensen, Tom, Anson, and a handful of their men followed in single file. There had been no lights burning in the windows facing the streets. As the small group moved through the alley close to the walls, Richard saw no windows. A few of the walls did have doors. At a narrow space between buildings, Owen turned in, following the brick path hardly wider than Richard's shoulders. Richard seized Owen by the arm. Is this the only way in? No. See there? The walkway goes through to the street in front, and there is another door inside that comes up on the other side of the building. Satisfied that they had alternative escape routes, Richard gave Owen a nod. They took the dark stairwell down to a room at the bottom under the building. Tom struck flint to steel a number of times until he managed to light a candle. Once the candle was lit, Richard gazed around at the small, empty, windowless room. What is this place? The basement of a palace, Owen said. Richard frowned at the man. What are we doing here? Owen hesitated and glanced at Kalen. Kalen saw the look. She pushed Richard down until he sat and leaned back against the wall. A foot-sore Betty squeezed between them and lay down beside Richard, pleased to have a rest. Jensen squatted close on the other side of Betty. 
Kara closed him in from the other side. Kaylin knelt in front of him and then sat back on her heels. Richard, I asked Owen to bring us here, to a place where we would be safe. We can't all go into that building to get the antidote. I suppose not. That's a good idea. Owen and I will go. The rest of you can stay here where no one will spot you. He started to get up, but Kaylin pushed him back down. Richard, you have to wait here. You can't go. You're dizzy. You need to save your strength. Richard gazed into her green eyes, eyes that always captivated him, always made everything else but her seem unimportant. He wished they could be alone somewhere peaceful, like the home he had built for her back in the mountains where he had taken her to recover after she had been hurt, when she had lost their unborn child after being beaten nearly to death by those brutes. She was the most precious thing alive. She was everything. He wanted so much for her to be safe. I'm strong enough, he said. I'll be fine. If you start coughing in that place where the soldiers are, then you'll be caught and never get out, much less recover the antidote. You and Owen would both be caught. There is no telling how many soldiers are in there. What will happen to us if you're caught? What would happen if... Her voice trailed off. She hooked a stray strand of hair behind an ear. Look, Richard, Owen went in there before. He can go in there again. Richard saw desperation in her eyes. She was terrified of losing him. He hated that he was making her afraid. That's right, Lord Rall, Owen assured him. I will get the antidote and bring it to you. While we're waiting, you can get some rest, Kalen said. Some sleep would do you more good than anything else until they bring back the antidote. Richard couldn't debate how tired he was. He still didn't like the idea of not going himself. Tom could go with him, Kara suggested. Richard looked up into Kara's blue eyes. He looked up into Kalin's eyes. He knew he had already lost this argument. How far is this place? Richard asked Owen. A goodly distance. Here we are just at the fringe of the city. I wanted to take us to a place where we would be less likely to encounter soldiers. The antidote is at most an hour distant. I thought it best if we were not too far into the city if we had to get back out, but we are close enough so that you will not have long to wait for the antidote. Richard nodded. All right, we'll wait here for you and Tom. Kalen paced in the small, damp basement as the others sat against the wall, waiting in silence. She couldn't stand the tension. It felt too much like a death watch. They were so close that it made it seem impossibly far. They had waited so long that the small amount of time left seemed an eternity that would never end. Kalen told herself to calm down. Shortly, Richard would have the antidote. He would be better then. He would be cured of the poison then. But what if it didn't work? What if he had already waited so long that he was beyond any cure? No, the man who had made the poison and the antidote had told Owen that this last dose would cure Richard of the poison for good. Because of the beliefs of these people, they would be certain that the poison was reversible. They would never have used it if they believed it would risk a life. But what if what they believed was wrong? Kaylin rubbed her shoulders as she paced and admonished herself to stop inventing problems to worry about. They had enough real problems without letting her imagination get carried away. They would get the antidote, and then they would address the problem with Richard's gift. After that, they had to turn their attention to larger issues of Jagang and his army. When Kaylin glanced over and saw that Richard had fallen sound asleep, she decided to go outside and watch for Owen and Tom. Kara, leaning against the wall beside Richard, guarding him while he slept, nodded when Kaylin whispered to her, telling her where she was going. Jensen, seeing that Kaylin was heading for the door, quietly followed her out. Betty had fallen asleep beside Richard, so Jensen left her there. The moonlit night had cooled. Kaylin thought she should be sleepy, but she was wide awake. She followed the brick path out between the buildings toward the alley. Owen will be back soon, Jensen said. Try not to worry. It will be over soon. Kalen glanced over in the dark. 
Even after he has the antidote, we still have his gift to worry about. Zed is too far. We're going to have to get to Nietzsche right away. She is the only one close enough that might know what to do to help him. Do you think the trouble with his gift is getting worse? Kaylin was haunted by the pain she so often saw in his eyes, but there was more to it. When he used the sword the last two times, I could see that even the sword's magic had failed him. He's in more trouble with his gift than he will admit. Jensen chewed her lower lip as she watched Kaylin pace. Tonight he will have the antidote, she finally said in soft assurance. Soon we can be on our way to Nietzsche. Kaylin turned when she thought she heard a noise in the distance. It had sounded like the crunch of a footstep. Two dark figures appeared off at the end of the alleyway. By the way one of them towered over the other, Kaylin was pretty sure that it was Tom and Owen. She wanted to run to meet them, but she knew how deadly tricks could be, so she drew Jensen back with her around the corner of the building into the darkest part of the shadows. This was no time to get careless. When the two men reached the narrow walkway and started to turn in, Kaylin stepped out in front of them, prepared to unleash her power if necessary. Mother Confessor, it's me, Tom, and Owen, Tom whispered. Jensen let out a breath. Are we ever glad to see you back? Owen looked both ways down the alley. When he turned to check, Kaylin saw moonlight reflect off tears running down his face. Mother Confessor, we have trouble, Tom said. Owen spread his hands. Mother Confessor, I... Kaylin grabbed his shirt in both hands. What's wrong? The antidote was there, wasn't it? You have it, don't you? No. Owen choked back his tears and pulled out a folded piece of paper. Instead of the bottle of antidote, I found this in its hiding place. Kaylin snatched it out of his hands. With trembling fingers, she unfolded the paper. She turned as she held it close so she could read it in the light of the moon. I have the antidote. I also hold by a thread the lives of the people of Bandakar. I can end all their lives as easily as I can end the life of Richard Rawl. I will give over the antidote and the lives of all the people in this empire in exchange for the Mother Confessor. Bring the Mother Confessor to the bridge over the river one mile to the east of where you are. In one hour, if I do not have the Mother Confessor, I will pour the antidote in the river, and then I will see to it that all the people of this city die. Signed, Emperor Nicholas. Kaylin, her heart racing out of control, started east. Tom grabbed her arm and held her back. Mother Confessor, I know what it says. Kaylin's hands wouldn't stop shaking. Then you know why I have no choice. Jensen put herself in front of Kaylin to stop her from starting out once again. What does the letter say? Nicholas wants me in exchange for the antidote. Jensen put her hands against Kaylin's shoulders to stop her. What? That's what the letter says. Nicholas wants me in exchange for the lives of everyone else in this empire and the antidote to save Richard's life. The lives of everyone else? But how could he carry out such a threat? Nicholas is a wizard. There are any number of deadly things available to such a man. If nothing else, he could use wizard's fire and incinerate the entire city. But his magic won't harm the people here. They're pristinely ungifted, the same as me. If he uses wizard's fire to set a building ablaze, like we did to those soldiers sleeping back in Owen's town, it won't matter to the people inside how the fire started. Once the buildings catch fire, then it's just regular fire, fire that will kill anyone. If not that, Nicholas has soldiers here. He could immediately start executing people. He could have thousands beheaded in hardly any time at all. I can't even imagine what else he could do. But he put this letter where the antidote was hidden, so I know he's not bluffing. Kaylin stepped around Jensen and started out again. She couldn't make herself stop trembling. She tried to slow her racing heart, but that didn't work either. Richard had to have the antidote. That was what mattered. She focused her attention ahead as she marched swiftly up the dark street. Tom paced along beside her, opposite Jensen. Mother Confessor, wait, we have to think this out. 
I already have. We can take a force of men to the meeting place. Take the antidote by force. Kalen kept going. From a wizard? I don't think so. Besides, if Nicholas were to see such a force coming, he would probably pour the antidote in the river. Then what? We have to do as he demands. We have to get our hands on the antidote, get it safely away from them. What makes you think that after Nicholas has you, he won't then pour it in the river? Tom asked. We'll have to make the exchange in a way that best ensures we get the antidote. We aren't going to rely on his goodwill and honesty. Owen and Jensen are pristinely ungifted. They won't be harmed by his magic. They can help make sure we get the antidote in the exchange. Jensen pulled her hair away from her face as she leaned close. Kalen, you can't do this. You can't. Please. Richard will go crazy. We all will. Please, for his sake, don't do this. At least he will be alive to go crazy. Tears streamed down Jensen's face. But this is suicide. Kalen watched the buildings, the streets, making sure there were no troops to hem them in. Let's hope Nicholas thinks so, too. Mother Confessor, Owen pleaded, you can't do this. This is what Lord Rall has shown us is wrong. You can't bargain with a man like Nicholas. You can't try to appease evil. I have no intention of appeasing Nicholas. Jensen wiped tears from her cheek. What do you mean? Kaelin stiffened her resolve. What is our best chance of getting rid of the Imperial Order in this city and all of Bandakar? Eliminating Nicholas. How better to get close to him than to make him think he has won? Jensen blinked in surprise. You intend to touch him with your power. That's what you're thinking, isn't it? You think you will have a chance to touch him with your confessor's power. If I get him in my sight, he's dead. Richard would never agree to this, Jensen said. I'm not asking him. This is my decision. Tom stepped in front of her, blocking the way. Mother Confessor, I'm sworn to protect the Lord Rall, and I understand risking your life to protect him. But this is different. You may be acting to try to save his life, but at what cost? We would lose too much. You can't do this. Owen moved around in front of her, too. I agree. Lord Rall will be more than crazy if you exchange yourself for the antidote. Jensen nodded her agreement. He will kill us all. He will take off our heads for allowing you to do this. Kalen smiled at their tense expressions. She put a hand to the side of Jensen's face. Remember back just after we'd met you, and I told you that there were times when there was no choice but to act? Jensen nodded, her tears returning. This is one of those times. Richard is getting sicker by the day. He's dying. If he doesn't get the antidote, he has no chance and will soon be dead. That's the truth of the way things are. How can we let this chance slip away from us? There are no more opportunities after this. Our chances to save him will forever be lost. It will be the end. I don't want to live without him. I don't want the rest of our people to live without him. If I do this, then Richard will live. If Richard lives, then there will still be a chance for me too. I can touch Nicholas with my power, or Richard and the rest of you can think of something to do to save me. But if Richard dies, then our chances end. But Mother Confessor, Jensen sobbed, if you do this, then we'll lose you. Kaylin looked to each face, her anger rising. If any of you have a better idea, then put words to it. Otherwise, you are risking me losing the only chance left. No one had anything to say. Kalen was the only one with a realistic plan of action. The rest of them had only wishes. Wishing would not save Richard. Kalen started out once again, hurrying her pace to get there in time. Chapter 57 Kalen paused in the quiet darkness not far from the bridge. She could just make out what appeared to be a burly man standing on the other side. He was all alone. She couldn't see his face or tell what he looked like. She scanned the far bank of the river along with the trees and buildings she could make out in the moonlight, looking for soldiers or anyone else. Jensen clutched her arm. Kalen, please. Her voice was choked with tears. 
Kaylin felt oddly calm. There were no options for her to weigh, so she suffered no gnawing indecision. There was only one choice. Richard lived or he died. It was as simple as that. The choice was clear. Her mind was made up, and with that came clarity and determination. She could now focus on what she was to do. The river through the city was larger than Kalin had expected. The steep banks to each side, in this area anyway, were a few dozen feet high and lined with stone blocks. The bridge itself, wide enough for wagons to pass each other, had two arches to make the span and side rails with simple stone caps. The waters below were dark and swift. It was not a river she would want to have to try to swim. Kalin approached as far as the foot of the bridge and stopped. The man on the other side watched her. Do you have the antidote? She called over to him. He lifted what looked like a little bottle high above his head. He lowered the arm and pointed to the bridge. He wanted her to come across. Mother confessor, Owen pleaded, won't you reconsider? She gazed into his wet eyes. Reconsider what? If I will have Richard live rather than let him succumb to the poison? If I will try to kill Nicholas in order to make it possible to defeat them and for your people to have a better chance to free themselves? How would I ever live with myself if Richard died without the antidote and I knew there was something I could have done that would have saved him and also have given me a chance to get close enough to Nicholas to eliminate him? I couldn't live with myself if I failed to do this. We are fighting this war to stop people like this, people who bring death upon us, people who want us dead because they cannot stand that we live our lives as we wish, that we are successful and happy. These people hate life. They worship death. They demand that we do the same and join them in their misery. As Mother Confessor, I decree vengeance without mercy against the Imperial Order. Changing from our course is suicide. I will not reconsider. What would you have us tell Lord Rawl? Tom asked. She smiled. That I love him, but he knows that. Kaylin unbuckled her sword belt and handed it to Jensen. Owen, come with me. Kaylin started out, but Jensen threw her arms around her and hugged her fiercely. Don't worry, she whispered. We'll get the antidote to Richard, and then we'll come back for you. Kaylin hugged Jensen briefly, whispering her thanks, and then started onto the bridge. Owen walked at her side, saying nothing. The man on the far side watched, but stayed where he was. In the center of the bridge, Kaylin stopped. Bring the bottle, she called across. Come over here and you can have it. If you want me, you will come to the center of the bridge and give the bottle to this man to take back, as Nicholas offered. The man stood for a time as if considering. He looked like a soldier. He didn't match the description of Nicholas that Owen had given her. Finally, he started onto the arch of the bridge. Owen whispered that it looked like the commander he had seen with Nicholas. Kalin waited, watching the man walk through the moonlight. He wore a knife at one side and a sword at his other hip. When he had almost reached her, he came to a halt and waited. Kalin held her hand out. The note said we were to trade, me for what Nicholas has. The man, his crooked nose flattened to the side, smiled. So we were. I am the mother confessor. Either give me the bottle or you die here now. He pulled the square-sided bottle from his pocket and placed it in her hand. Kaylin saw that it was full of clear liquid. She pulled the cork and smelled it. It had the slight aroma of cinnamon as had the other bottles of the antidote. He goes back with this, Kalin said to the grim-looking man as she handed Owen the bottle. And you come with me, the man said as he grabbed her wrist, or we all die on this bridge. He may go, as agreed, but if you try to run, you will die. Kalin glanced to Owen. Go, she growled. Owen looked over at the man with black hair, then back to her. He looked like he had a lot to say, but he nodded and then ran back over the bridge to where Tom and Jensen stood waiting, watching. When Owen reached the other two, the man said, Let's go unless you'd like to die here. Kalin yanked her arm back. When he turned and started out, 
She followed behind him as they crossed the rest of the way over the bridge. She scanned the shadows among the trees on the far side of the river, the thousand hiding places among buildings beyond, the streets in the distance. She didn't see anyone, but that didn't make her feel any better. Nicholas was there, somewhere, hiding in the darkness, waiting to have her. Suddenly, the night lit up from behind. Kalen spun and saw the bridge enveloped in a boiling ball of flame. The fire turned black as it billowed up. Stones sailed into the air above the inferno. As the luminous cloud rose, she could see the bridge beneath the roaring fireball crumpling. The arches caved in on themselves, and the entire structure began the long drop into the river. With icy dread, Kalen wondered if there were any more bridges across the river. How would she get back to Richard if she succeeded? How was help going to get to her if she didn't? On the far side, Kalen could see Tom, Jensen, and Owen running back up the road toward where Richard slept. They were not about to waste time watching a bridge being destroyed. At the thought of Richard, Kalen almost let out a sob. The man unexpectedly shoved her. Move! She glared at him, at his self-satisfied smile, at the smug confidence she saw in his eyes. As she walked ahead of this man, and he occasionally shoved her, Kalen's temper was on a low boil. She had the urge to use her power and take out the despicable brute, but she had to concentrate on the task at hand, Nicholas. Walking up the street leading away from the river, she was just able to make out soldiers hanging back in the shadows on the dark side streets, blocking every escape route. It didn't matter. At the moment, she wasn't interested in escape, but in her objective. The man behind her, as arrogantly as he was behaving, was also wary and treated her with cautious contempt. The farther she walked into the city on the far side of the river, the closer the clusters of small buildings were packed together. Side streets of narrow, twisting warrens ran off among the ramshackle structures. What trees there were grew crowded in close to the street. Their branches hung out over her like arms raised to snatch her in their claws. Kalen tried not to think about how deep she was getting into enemy territory and how many men were surrounding her. The last time she had been surrounded and trapped by such savage men, she had been beaten and had come perilously close to dying. Her unborn child had died. Her child. Richard's child. She had also lost a kind of innocence that day, a simplistic sense of her invincibility. In its place had come the understanding of how frail life was, how frail her own life was, and how easily it could be lost. She knew how much it had hurt Richard to fear he might lose her. She remembered the terrible agony in his eyes every time he had looked at her. It was completely different from the pain she saw in his eyes from his gift. It had been a helpless suffering for her. She hated the thought of that pain returning to haunt him. From the shadows to the right side, a man stepped out from behind a building. He wore black robes, covered in layers of what looked like strips of cloth, almost as if he were covered in black feathers. They lifted in the breeze created by his stride, lending him an unsettling floating fluidity as he moved. His hair was slicked back with oils that glistened in the moonlight. Close-set, small black eyes, rimmed in red, peered out at her from an altogether unwholesome face. He held his wrists to his chest, as if he were holding back claws tipped with black fingernails. Kalen needed no introduction to know that this was Nicholas the Slide. She had taken confessions from men who appeared to be no more than polite young men, working fathers or kindly grandfathers, but in truth were men who had carried out acts of ruthless cruelty. To look at them behind their bench where they made shoes, or behind a counter where they sold bread, or in a field tending their animals, it would be difficult to believe them capable of their vile crimes. But looking at Nicholas, Kalen saw such utter corruption that it tainted everything about the man right down to the indecent squint of his eyes. The prize of prizes, Nicholas hissed. He reached out, making a fist. And I have her. Kalen hardly heard him. 
she was already lost to the commitment of wielding her power. This was the man who held the lives of innocent people hostage. This was the man who had brought suffering and death in his shadow. This was the man who would kill her and Richard if given the chance. She snatched his outstretched wrist capped with his fist. He appeared no more than a statue before her. The night, sprinkled with a vault of stars, seemed cold and distant. Beneath her grip of him, Kalin could feel Nicholas tense, as if to draw back his arm, but it was too late. He had no chance. He was hers. Time was hers. The men all around who had begun rushing in were far too distant to matter. They could never reach her in time to save Nicholas. Not even the man who had brought her from the bridge, who now stood not more than a few paces away, was close enough to matter. Time was hers. Nicholas was hers. She gave no thought to what those men would do to her. Right then it didn't matter. Right then nothing but her ability to do what needed doing mattered. This man had to be eliminated. This was the enemy. This was the man who had invaded a land to torture, rape, and murder innocent people in the name of the Imperial Order. This was a man who had been mutated by magic into a monster designed to destroy them. This man was a tool of conquest, a being of evil. This was the man who held Richard's life in the balance. The power within raged to be released. All her emotions evaporated from the heat of that power. She no longer felt fear, hate, anger, horror. The emotions behind her reasons were now gone. In the all-consuming race of time suspended before the violent rush of her power, she felt only a resolute determination. Her power had become an instrument of pure reason. All her barriers fell before it. In an infinitesimal spark of time, as she watched the beady eyes staring at her, her power became all. As she had done countless times before, Kaylin released her restraint on it and released herself into the flux of violence focused to a singular purpose. Where she should have felt the exquisite release of merciless force, she felt instead a terrifying emptiness. Where there should have been the fierce twisting of her power through this man's mind, there was nothing. Kaylin's eyes went wide as she gasped, as she felt hot pain knife through her, as she felt the thrust of something foreign and terrible beyond anything she could have imagined. Hot agony lanced through her consciousness all the way into her very soul. It felt as if her insides were being ripped apart. She tried to scream, but couldn't. The night went blacker still. Kaylin heard laughter echoing through her soul. Chapter 58 Richard's eyes popped open. He felt suddenly, completely, horrifyingly wide awake. The hair at the back of his neck lifted. It felt as if all his hair wanted to stand on end. His heart raced nearly out of control. He shot to his feet. Kara, right beside him, caught his arm, surprised to see him suddenly stand up. Looking as if she feared he might fall, she frowned in concern. Lord Rall, what's the matter? Are you all right? The room was silent. Startled faces all around stared at him. Get out, he yelled. Get your things. Everyone out now. 